Hey, everybody. Uh, this is just a casual hangout. Um, chat about Blades in the Dark and games in general and whatever. So uh, anybody on the forums that wants to come in and chat, feel free. Ask questions if the Q&A thing is on or just jump into the to the chat itself or to the hangout itself, whatever you want to do. Um, I'm going to be working on stuff, so uh, I don't think anyone's actually shown up yet. I'm just talking to YouTube right now. <laughs> but uh, pop in if you want to, and uh, we'll chat about whatever. Yes, Adam. Sorry, uh, I was looking at another window. That's that's correct. Uh, you can type into the Q and A, and I'll I'll see those. Assuming I have the window up, <laughs> uh, and I'll I'll answer your questions. Yeah. Um, if you want, if you want to join the chat, I I can send you an invite. I I think I invited everybody from the forum, but um, it, I don't know if you can actually join or not. So, let me know if you want to act. If you want to like be in the hangout, and I can send you a an invite or whatever. <clears throat> Okay, cool. Let me see if I can invite you here. One sec. <clears throat> okay. Invitation away. figured this out. Adam, hello. Hello. <laughs> yeah, it's awesome. Um you can hear me fine? Yeah, yeah. How, how, yeah cool. Do I sound okay? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you're you're fine. Good, good. Uh well it's nice to meet you virtually. Um, yeah. This thanks is... so much for jumping in and, and running the game on day one, basically. That was awesome. Yeah, we were, as I said, like we were already scheduled to like because I our, we, we we just finished like a Campaign of like a, a short campaign of like a deep forest. Oh, mm. someone's here. Yep. Oh, wait. 
Something weird is happening. Oh. Sounds like... I'm hearing that from the past. What's, what's happening? Um... Oh, do you have it open? <laughs> uh... I mean, shouldn't be me because I'm on a headset. Uh... Uh, I don't know what that was. That was weird. All right. Okay. Well, what? Oh, wait, so <laughs> is it just us? Oh, I, I, I thought a third person had joined and was... I thought they had too, but who knows? Hang on. <laughs> <laughs> That's really weird. <laughs> um, all right. It was um, currently... Yes. Yeah. No, this, this is, it, was, it was a super exciting experience, basically. It... I found out about this game like last week, and I joined the Kickstarter two days ago, and then this came, this came up, and we were all, all scheduled to try out a new game, and I was like, "Well, <laughs> <we're> doing this." <laughs> well, that's it's very bold to jump in uh, into the deep end like that and run something you've never tried before, but that's very cool. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I just played like I had just played like I think. Like Magister Lore and Lady Blackbird for the first time like two weeks ago at a con, and oh, so wow. was, yeah, nice. This is this is this is this is my month of your games. <laughs> <laughs> what, um, what con was it? <clears throat> what was that? What con did you go to? Um, con of the North in um, Minneapolis, St. Paul. Oh okay. <laughs> we ran games on demand there. It was a good time. Nice. <clears throat> this is someone else, right? That noise. Or uh, something else, probably on my computer, making a noise. I don't know. Yeah, not yet. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, sure. Like, I mean, I've, I've, I have... If, if you just want to talk, talk about this game, I have, like, things to talk about. Sure, uh, yeah. I mean, we can talk about whatever, but if you, if you want us to talk about yeah. Blade, that's cool. Yeah. I, yeah, this is... I mean, that's what I'm... That's certainly what I've been thinking about all day. Um, yeah. Like, in the sort of the... How long of a, how long do you think a campaign goes in terms of sessions and, and slash scores in your experience? Uh, it varies. Um, I the I think a very long term. Well, it depends on what you mean by long term. We the original campaign, uh, very first playtest was, oh I don't know, um, nine months, ten months of, of weekly games. So that's. 40-ish sessions, maybe. Mm-hmm. Um, and by then, the, the the crew stuff wasn't really cemented back then, so mm-hmm. uh, it was kind of being built. But, like, fiction-wise, they had gotten to a point where we felt like, you know, we were getting to the end of their right. run. Um, and now the way crew advancement and tiering up works, uh, I would say you could play as long as you want for, like, a normal game group. Like, most people don't play past 30 sessions, maybe, or 50 mm-hmm. or something like that. But I wouldn't I wouldn't necessarily recommend it for very short series, necessarily. I, mm-hmm. I mean, a single score can be fun, or a single, you know, session can be fun, um, or two or three would be fine, but all the advancement stuff is built for a long, pretty long-term game. I, I, at least a dozen sessions, I would think. That's what I was hoping, like, and that's what that's what it felt like looking at it. Um, I know that, like, I, I, I had a similar feel to like, like, I guess like, four years ago, like when our gaming group like like played Apocalypse World for the first time, and like it turned out that that really only works like, from twelve to eighteen sessions. It like it like reaches a reaches a cap there, and in our experience, like that. Where, where like you're, you 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 you've said what you're gonna say about the world, and in this one, it, it I was like looking at the the crew advancement stuff. Looked like it might actually, you know, be be something. It 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 has it has a similar like the game has a similar feel, but I was hoping that like this would be something that could last longer than that. If that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. I I I'm trying to hit you know like a middle not a middle ground exactly, but like between uh, long and very long somewhere in there where. The advance, the mechanical advancement. Assuming you're playing real fast and you're doing uh, kind of normal length four-hour sessions, which is plenty to do two scores. Mm-hmm. In. Um, so that that's gonna that has an internal kind of um, level up, which is going to be generating heat and and coin and hold. Right. And at, at the session scale, you have crew and PC development, which is kind of locked by session, no matter how many scores you do. Um, 
and you're kind of maybe going to level up that way every two sessions, depending on how, how you go. So with a good, you know, six-ish uh, advancements right out of the gate, that's that's about 12 sessions of, of mm -hmm. minimum to kind of get through that stuff. But fiction-wise, like actually getting your crew up to Tier 3, if you set that as a goal, mm -hmm. uh, that doesn't have a particular... Uh, length session length, you know, it's hard, right. it's really hard to judge how that's going to go, or if you, you can do it, you might not be able to do it. Mm -hmm. um, it's it's not a sure thing at all. <laughs> it's it's actually pretty hard to do. Yeah, I was actually wondering about like I sort of I was thinking about that because like I, I we offered like in, in the session I played the, um like a lot of the the devil's bargains that the, that the people were offering each other were like you know um getting getting an extra die for like. Um, losing favor with a particular faction, like, like you know, that like I think yeah they 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 went to like negative two with like the Church of the Ecstasy of the Flesh by getting in like some like theological argument. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, that was awesome. And, right, and like, and I, I feel like my, I, I I have the the feeling that that's actually going to have like much more of a mechanical effect than my like a negative effect on them than like the players were. Ex we're sort of expecting, or sort of are used to, from you know, from other games with with sort of um, faction alliances. And it's like, like I, I feel like factions are powerful here in, in comparison to to some other things. Like it's not so transitory. Yeah, I would agree with that. Um, there's there's definitely these thresholds where you kick over, where you realize, oh no, like we've had this enemy for a while, but now they're minus three. Now they're like they're right. sitting somewhere in their lair, planning on how to destroy us now, and that sucks, but a dynamic that's come out of that, which which I really enjoy, is because of the way the development bonus works. You get a bonus on your development roll when for all the level three statuses you have, right? Yes. You get negative ones, right? Right. So you get to this point where, whole, like, keeping a very not powerful, but keeping a really mean enemy is gonna it keeps giving you bonus dice uh, every development, and there's this little thing that happens. You know, players you know want the binny, right? So there's this moment where they have to decide, like, are we really going to take these guys out? They're such a pain, and they're, mm -hmm. they're constantly messing with us, but they give us a bonus die. <laughs> so, you know, <laughs> do we really want to take them out, or should we just let them be our enemies? And uh, that's, that's kind of fun. So Tier 3 is just sort of the max in the whole game? No, like... uh, there's... I don't, I don't think it's in the Quick Start. Actually, well, it might be. I, I, the Duskwall Council might be Tier 4 on that Yes, list. there's the Duskwall Council and the Skovlander Refugees. Right, right, yeah. Tier um, fours. Yeah, there is... I don't know uh, when I'm going to really develop this. It'll be, you know, after Blades launches and everything. But, right. Uh, the original, original, like, draft of this game uh, was, like, super scalable and modular, so mm -hmm. this there was this game, which was, like, the first three tiers... And then when you sh shifted to tier four, each player instead of a character playbook, they got a crew, and then your your fact your crew sheet became a faction sheet, and and you scaled up. So like now like I'm running all the all the like uh, thieves in the city, and you're running this other thing. Oh, and, like we all just scale up a, a set. Interesting. Uh, and play like play like a whole each of us plays a whole crew of characters. Um, okay. Like trying to do some bigger, fat, bigger scale thing. I don't know if that's really going to be the way I want to implement it, but I, there's definitely in the in the bigger world that you can play in. Uh, James Stewart's um, stretch goal, Broken Crown, uh, which is about uh, revolutionaries who want to kill the immortal emperor, um, or or at least uh, remove him from power. <clears throat> um, that one is is definitely going to touch into that realm where you're going to be contending with. The crown and the crown is probably like year six ish maybe, um, so that that place or that uh, yeah that place that will kind of it'll start to introduce some ideas of what you know what happens when you do that when you try to go up against these really powerful um, powerful tiers, <clears throat> and of course you know the obvious answer is like you don't you don't hit them where they're strong you hit them where they're weak. But. Mm -hmm. It'll be fun to see how that develops. And there are a couple other uh, hacks. I think um, Strash's uh, Band of Blades military hack is going to play with uh, tier sizes and you know a company of soldiers and that kind of stuff. Because mm -hmm. yeah, I did see those two rank four tiers, and I was like, 
surely if we re- if we're like tier two or three and we reduce them to zero, we can take their spot, right? Absolutely. Surely that's a thing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, in a way, I kind of have to put that on there, right? Like, if the game says, yeah. "Oh, there's three tiers," and then you ha- you have to put a tier four on there just to just to like twist the knife a little bit and make people mm-hmm. think about it. And, um, right. Looks like we got some questions here on the on oh. the chat. I'm just gonna run through these, or not real quick, but just go hit the top one. Um, Michael Prescott is asking, so what's the DNA of this game, and where did it spring from? Um, so I will try to tell this story as quickly as I can. Um, the very short version is when uh, Sage and Adam were developing Dungeon World. Um, Sage is in my, uh, my, <laughs> we're in a game group together, we play on Wednesdays, and uh, during the development of Dungeon World, uh, on Tuesday nights we would always go out, we'd go out to this German beer pub and talk about game design and stuff, um, so throughout the whole development of Dungeon World, I was kind of like pushing for Sage to make it into this other game, which uh, he didn't want to do, um, and good for him, he, he made, he and Adam made Dungeon World the way they wanted, which is awesome. Um, but in the back of my mind, I was like, well, there's kind of this, like, other version of it that I think is cool, and, um, it, it's, like, kind of the, the way I roughly remember, um, playing Mold Bay, because uh, we were so obsessed with, <laughs> like, st- uh, roll under stat checks from the back of that, and, and the encounter tables and stuff, so I'll, I'm going to do World of Dungeons, I'm going to do this, like, fake 1970s, um, version of, of Dungeon World that's this kind of cutesy thing with one move, and blah, blah, blah. Um, but the, the design, like the designer brain part of World of Dungeons was I wanted to make something that was in the style of Apocalypse World but gave you just one, one um, blunt instrument to play with so that once you start playing, like instead of having to like learn all your classes and learn all your moves and learn all this stuff, you can start playing with this really bare minimum single uh, defy danger, act under fire move basically. But it doesn't take people very long to kind of feel dissatisfied by that and feel like there should be more to this. This is just too, this isn't enough. And that kicks in the design, you know, brain to start thinking about, well, what if we had to move for this? What if we had to move for that? Um, and so I, I started running that game in development at my office. Uh, all the, not all, but a bunch of people at my office at the company I used to work for, they said, hey, you do D&D stuff. Like, do, make it, do D&D for us. We've never played it before, so let's let's play it. So we started, we started playing, and I, I didn't tell them anything. I, I put the game in front of them, and we started playing it, and only, it only took a few sessions before, before someone said, well, I want to find out, like, I, it seems like they're lying to me. Like, how can, how can I tell if they're lying to me? And so I pretended like we were making it up. I was like, okay, well, what if, what if you roll and add your wisdom and then if you get, like, a 10 or more, you could ask me, like, three questions or something like that about what they were saying. And we just turned it into this little game, sort of. And then somebody died. Someone, you know, went to zero hit points. And I said, do you want to make a bargain with death, maybe? And they were like, yeah. And we, we slowly sort of built our own game out of it. It wasn't totally Dungeon World, but it was in that direction. Um, and then the... Man, this story is not short, is it? Uh, and then the... Uh, the final uh, episode of that, it was like about nine people coming in and out. We've had four or five people every week playing. But the very last session, we had these three players there, uh, Allison and Keith and Mike, and Keith uh, was playing this wizard, and they had the Eye of Kotar, and they had made done a deal with this shade of a wizard to take it to the gates of death under the, the bottom of the world, and in the critical moment when everything was going south, the Shadow Wizard made a bargain with Keith's character in exchange for immortality. Keith, you know, plunged the Eye of Kotar into the Gates of Death and destroyed them forever. And Keith took the bargain, uh, and and uh, we we uh, rolled initiative. Uh, Mike's Mike, uh, his character turned into a sea demon by that point, and uh, he he had spent uh, his last like couple levels like trying to get reflexes so he could always go first because Keith already had it. So they had to roll off to see who went first. Mike went first. He rolled his 2d6 armor-piercing claws against Keith's wizard's uh, six hit point, or seven hit points. He rolled six points of damage on 2d6. Keith, he survived with one hit point, plunged the eye in, broke the gates of death, de- re- destroyed the world, basically. Uh, it, was, it was really fun and crazy, and 
Um, so I was like, okay, let's take a break. And uh, I sent emails around to the work people, like, let's do, let's play something else. Do you want to play, <clears throat> you know, Fiasco or whatever? Or do you want to play a game set a thousand years in the future after the gates of death have been destroyed and the world is all fucked up and things are weird? Um, and everyone said, oh, let's do that. Let's do a thousand years in the future. So um, that's where Ghost Lines came from, uh, a mini game of mine, where I just kind of imagined the consequences of what happened and then wanted to move into a more sort of industrial technological age since it was so far in the future. Um, so we played that for a little while, and then that went on hiatus. And uh, when I started messing around with the systems um, that sort of came out of Regiment and Ghost Lines, um, and my game Danger Patrol, which I was working on a lot at the time, um, it all just gelled in my head, and I thought, you know, yeah, the, the new Thief game was coming out back then, and we were all super excited about it. We didn't know that it was bad. <laughs> so... Everyone was super pumped, and, and Will Hindmarch's game, Dark, Will's a, a friend of mine, and um, I was all super excited about his game, too, and it, it was just all in our brain. Uh, Matt Snyder, also, um, who designed Dust Devils, he, he was working on a, uh, like a scoundrelly game called Dagger and Shadow, <laughs> and we were all playing each other's games and just totally in that space, and was like, man, this whole ghost, ghost line setting is like super good for this. It's, it's a lot like Dishonored, it's a lot like uh, Thief, so... Um, we started with uh, basically like I, not even World of Dungeons. We started with um, a single D6 mechanic um, as a placeholder for everything, and just started playing with, with kind of nothing. Um, oh, except we did start. We started with um, the stats. The stats used to be the uh, character types. So you had your stats were like Cutter, Lurk, Whisper, and you had like different points in them. Um, we, yeah, we started with that. We played that for a year of iterations until it builds into what it is now. Uh, so, yeah, Michael, that was a really long-winded answer to your question. Um, a lot of games went into that, and uh, in, in a way, it, it also came from um, running a lot of Apocalypse World and Dungeon World, just, I don't know, 200 plus sessions at, at this point. And Acting under fire and defy danger is like such a great mechanic, mm -hmm. but after that much use, I just I needed something else, and so this idea of these like three versions of it came out um, to really highlight uh, the, posi the fictional positioning of the characters and say, yeah, you're acting under fire, but this time it's desperate, and this time it's risky, and this time it's controlled. And, that's what made me interested in doing it as a as an actual released, you know, product because I felt like I had something interesting to do as a designer to try something slightly new and different and explore that. The other thing that our our group at least was like kept saying this was reminded them of was Fall in London. Mm. Is that thing? Absolutely, yeah. Um, it's funny, I, I, we talked about this, there's an RPG net thread about this game, and somebody asked about Fallen London on that, and Vincent Baker and I were, we were writing the Fallen London RPG for a little while, um, yeah. and uh, I, in, a, in a way it's a big bummer that it, that it didn't work out, but in another way, um, he's making some super cool games uh, that can't follow it on that, and I got to make Blades in the Dark, so it's all good. But yeah, uh, that setting, man. I, I played that game like almost every day for like six months or something. It just got into my brain. I can't wait to play Sunless Sea. Um, I've been on a video game moratorium like all through the development of Blades in the Dark, so I've got like eight games waiting for me. Oh my god, we got disconnected. Adam, you're 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 gone. I think we're still there. Can everyone still hear me? Oh, no. Oh, okay, good. The questions are still there. I thought we lost them. David, I, I actually can see your questions on the Q&A thing, uh, and I'm about to answer them. 
I just answered Michael's first because he was he was first. I hope everyone can still hear us. Um, yeah, it looks like we're still going. Okay. So next is David Berg has some questions about planning, I believe. Uh, oh boy, they got all shuffled up here. Um, one moment. Ah, okay. So he's asking about scores. Um, where do the score options at any given moment come from? That's a good question. Uh, this is super important to me uh, as a designer and as a GM. I I ran Stars Without Number for whatever, 60 sessions or something, and that game is amazing and the faction system is like super cool, uh, and Kevin just gives you all these awesome tools to make manage that and make it fun. Um, so running that game for so long got just got into my bones, but as awesome as Stars Without Number is, the thing I really like to do as a designer is like not not just give the like little uh, tags and tidbits like Kevin gives you that you can sit and dream about and like invent your own cool stuff when you roll like you know police state tomb world or whatever like you got to come up with something cool out of that which is super great um, but I kind of like to give it a, a one step more detail so it's like a specific person and a the name of the faction and you know like give it a sort of a uh, canonize it a little bit, give it a, some branding. Um, so that, that's, that's, where, that's where the impetus to do factions and stuff came from, was running Stars Without Number. Um, but so that feeds into where scores come from, which is I don't want the GM to have to do a lot of in, uh, between session prep, or basically none. I, I don't prep ever when I run games, and I, I just hate doing it. So uh, it, it's just not for me. I just don't like it. Um, and Stars Without Number, I did it, uh, and it was still kind of fun, but um, I wanted to reduce that to zero. So the way scores work, um, this is sort of, it's not in the quick start, but it's kind of embodied by the quick start. What, what you do is you, uh, like if you're running a normal game, not the quick start, the players would uh, each go around and with the faction sheet, and they would assign positive and negative ticks to various factions. Like, oh, I have a history with the... Gondoliers, uh, you know, my dad was a gondolier, whatever, so I have a positive with them, and we'll have a negative with the blue coats because everybody does, uh, or whatever. And you end up with this little profile for the crew, like you had bad experiences with these and good with these, and these are like they dislike you more and these like you more. So the GM ends up with this sort of um, uh, profile for the crew. And then during character creation, um, while they're you know hashing stuff out amongst themselves. You take a look at those factions and look at who like who they're best friends with, who they're you know strongest with, who their biggest enemy is, um, and then uh, pick the faction that you like the best. So that gives you three three things, <laughs> and then uh, each faction in the back of the book, kind of like in the quick start with the lamp blacks and the red sashes and the crows, they have a little like situation and a little thing they're trying to work on. <clears throat> so you take those three factions you've picked, you look at their little stat block thingy, and you go, okay, the crows hate them, and what they're trying to do is establish control of the district. The inspectors really like them, and what they're trying to do is, you know, wrap up this case against this this noble who they know is a, um, a spirit smuggler or whatever. Um, and my favorite faction is the spirit wardens because they are cool and have their masks and stuff. So what are they up to? Uh, they're trying to do this. Then you just take three index cards, and you put the put the jobs out. Like, the people that you hate, here's the thing they're trying to do. How do you want to mess with them? How do you want to thwart their ambitions here? Um, you, they're your enemies, so um, this is what they're trying to accomplish. Mess, mess with them. Then you put out the card for their friends, and you say, your allies are trying to do this. Um, if you if you want, you can go to them, and they'll, they'll tell you how you can help, or if you can take your own initiative and try to help them out with their thing. And then you do the same thing with the, the faction you like. So you, you instantly have three three jobs, but they're they're not um, they're not like real jobs until you have that little conversation, right? So 
when the group says, oh, yeah, 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 we're definitely going to mess with the crows, then then you get into the role play part. You you paint the picture, there's the scene or whatever, and you get into, like, exactly what it is. Um, but you don't have to prep all that ahead of time and then, like, hope they pick that one or anything like that. Um, it really is just those three. And then there are guidelines for, like, how to, what to do after that, like, how to do the very first scene and then how to... You know, between the first score and the second score, what do you do? And between the first session and the second session, what do you do? And, and that kind of stuff. But I suspect that most people won't really care about that too much because just, just doing that first little bit is enough to run a whole campaign on. Like, everything that falls out of that um, runs the campaign, essentially. Because after they make their first move, they've hurt the crows, which means the crows' allies are now their enemies. And now the crow's enemies are now courting them to be their friends, and everything ripples outward, and um, people make unreasonable demands, and they push back, and you know, the the faction list. It's 24 things, which seems like a lot, but it's such a small world that just everything the players do, that the, the PC crew does, just just pushes everyone around, and um, that that drives drives the game. So. The GM d definitely has tools to sort of like present things to the group, but that, in my experience, that lasts basically one session, and after that, the players are like, "Now we're going to do this. Now we're going to do this. Now we're going to do this," and they just drive everything, um, which I think is the great uh, win for for games about rogues. I forget who wrote that blog post years ago about the the, the rogue RPG, like um, the fact that you're proactive, that you don't wait to find out about a dungeon, or you don't wait for the bad guys to rob the bank so you can stop them or whatever, your your group is like, the world is sort of your victim, and so um, it can be very player-driven uh, because the GM doesn't need to... Like, when you play Champions, right, it's kind of hard. You, you fly around, you're like, do we see any crimes happening? You know, has, Is anyone threatening the world? And you just kind of depend on the GM to tell you interesting things. But when you're the villains, you're like, fuck it, let's, let's blow up the Golden Gate Bridge or whatever, like you come up with some crazy plan and you, and you go do it. So um, that's not an accident, right? The, those things go together so well that um, it was easy for a... I wanted to make a player-driven game, and a game about rogues is, like, the best uh, combo, I think, in my opinion. I, uh, maybe that answered your question, David. I don't know. Um, I, I was rambling. Boy, we've got a lot of questions here. Okay, I'll try to go faster. Um... Okay, uh, and, and feel free to jump in, Adam, whenever you want. Uh, cool. I'll just keep talking if you don't stop me, so uh, please. Um, All right. If you, if you have opinions on any of this stuff, please uh, please feel free. Okay. Um, uh, yes, okay, new, new question. Um, how fleshed out will Duskwall and Uduwasha be in their respective setting books? Namely, how much white space are they each going to have, knowing that every group will wipe some default content to make the setting their own? Yeah, that's that's a good question. Um, uh, I would say they're they're um, they're extremely broadly uh, covered, but they're very very shallow. So, like, if you look in the quick start, there's like a list of notable people in Duskwall, um, and that it's a you know there's a bunch of characters that you can use for most of your campaign, probably. But all it says is, like, Lannick is an art forger, and so-and-so is this, is a ruthless dude who collects pieces of art or whatever. And they're all like that. It covers a lot of people, and it covers a lot of places. The map gives you lots of different locations. Um, it gives, there's a whole, there's a blank map, a blank, sub, blank surface map, and blank subterranean map, so you can just go nuts and do whatever you want with it. Then there are labeled versions of both of those if you want landmarks, you know, called out. And the map also has little, like, scoundrel notes on it, um, kind of like the old Shadowrun books uh, with the characters writing on the internet together. Like, there's little notes, like, uh, there's a ghost door under this thing or whatever. Um, so it's fairly, like, there's a lot of stuff to play with, but it doesn't give you just tons and tons of background or lots of details or anything. That Everything is a little impression, a little... Um, hook, and then all the factions and vice purveyors share that same pool of places and people and stuff. So 
when you look at the factions, it'll you know among their allies will be some of the people that sell the PCs their drugs, and some of those people will be targets on someone's hit list, and so they're all they're all linked up and connected, and um, and then for each city, each city kind of has a theme. Uh, Duskwalls is basically the classic city of thieves issue, like all organizations, including the city council and the cops, are all gangs of some kind that are all making you know, money illegally in various ways and being thugs in various ways. Um, Uduwash's theme is uh, the sort of dwindling of hu humanity, that the, the demons uh, are ascendant there and humans are, are losing control of, of their place. <laughs> so uh, if you choose to play a human gang in Uduwash, then you're you're, you know, I, it's not quite like this, but I always imagine the, you know, the opening of Terminator, like you're, you're, you're sort of fighting Skynet, kind of. That's the way I think. Um, or you can play a demon uh, group that's uh, kind of, t you know, taking control of, on the other demons and trying to. Um, Are the rules fundamentally different in those other like places? Like, do factions like work differently? Uh, they're really similar, but there are little there are little differences. Um, <coughs> Some of the some of the things that like the mechanics the same, but some of the triggers are a little different. Like the way the the, the thing you do that might change your status is a little different. Stuff like that. But the mechanic itself is the same. You know, when you get to plus three, you can try to move up and stuff like that. That's all the same. Um, but the fictional uh, triggers are, are different, <laughs> or somewhat. Different, anyway. um, same thing with uh, um, items and and. Uh, uh, occult powers and stuff like that. There's little differences um, between the two, but those those are in the same setting, so they're not they're not hugely different. But the can't like what the campaigns are about will be a little bit different. Uh, let's see. A lot of questions. A lot of questions. <laughs> so, oh boy, man! Thanks for all the questions, you guys. These are great. Um, it's so hard to choose. Okay, uh, David says, "How do you present the different scoundrel sheets to players, especially those who are not familiar with the style of games?" Um, that's a really good question. Uh, the the full game, I I hadn't thought of it doing about doing this for each playbook, but I. Maybe this is a good idea. The, the full game has a pretty good list of touchstones <clears throat> that you can sort of pitch the game uh, to hopefully connect um, with your players. Say, like, this, you know, have you ever, you know, watched The Wire? Have you ever watched Boardwalk Empire? Like, let, let, go down the list and hope you hit something um, that, that resonates with them. Like, okay, cool. And then it's like, it's like Longmar or, like, uh, uh, Sigil, or you know, you can kind of like start throwing out these different touchstone references. Try to find some common ground there to get everybody in some kind of same space. But yeah, for the playbooks themselves, um, I don't really have touchstones for those. That's a that's an interesting thought. Uh, the thing I noticed that was different between this game and other yeah, playbooks. Yeah. The, uh, but the difference between this game and other playbook games I've played is that there weren't those little like just little like bits of flavor text in there for the, for everyone to read. There wasn't like, you know, a couple couple sentences about what it is to be a lurk. Yeah, yeah. I I I definitely like I don't know, I dug my heels in on that a little bit. Um but I'm I'm I think I'm just being difficult. That it's probably a good idea to have something like that. Um, you know, I always want to just get give the bare minimum impression and let people's imaginations kinda carry the rest of the way, but yeah, uh, it, it might need those. The One of the playsets, the Null Vector playset has, has that for the types. It has, has little blurbs. Um, so, yeah, yeah, maybe it does need that. Um, but to answer the question how I do it, we, we always have a little conversation, you know, because someone says, what are I'm like, oh, you know, um, it's, uh, you know, imagine... Um, uh, Fawford from Fawford and Green Mouse. If that if that doesn't ring a bell, then um, you know we go to other media and other things to talk about. Um, but yeah, a nice succinct little 
um, pitch for each playbook is it that seems like something you need at the table. Uh, there's a reason why uh, Vincent did that. So maybe maybe, uh, maybe I'm giving up being stubborn on that one. Uh, Mike Underwood asks, um, for hack-minded folks, how do folks see fantasy race qualities coming into play for Blades? Um, is that a different set of heritages? Um, is it narrative color? Do you have playbooks for the different species or, or whatever? Um, I think the answer is yeah to all that. I think it, it's up to the playset author. Um, you know, if I was doing, like, let's say you did a playset for, for uh, Dragera for... for uh, the Vlad Taltush's, you know, city, um, where, you know, you have elves and humans, uh, but, eh, does it, it doesn't matter that much. They have some different qualities, and they certainly have different statuses, um, so having that be a heritage uh, would probably be fine. You might not need anything else. Um, they get a little bonus, right, like they don't, get, they don't get sick when they get teleported or something, but um, it's pretty minor. But in a classic D&D sense, like, everyone expects there to be some kind of big difference between a dwarf and an elf and an orc and whatever. They, they have a species move or something or a special quality. So in that case, um, you could do playbooks. You could do uh, sort of species-specific things. Like when you choose the elf, you know, you're not just like, I'm an elf. You're like, I'm a sword dancer or whatever. Or you're a orc berserker, and that's your playbook. Uh, and then in that case, you know, you'd have some special ability based on your species, just because it was your playbook. Uh, but it would also be totally fine to have um, sort of heritage moves like uh, like Planar Codex does, um, and just stick it over there under the heritage thing to say, okay, if you circle or you know, um, you you have a a free uh, armor box, you know, and if you circle elf. Uh, you get a bonus side to inside effect or whatever. Uh, that that would be totally fine. Um, pretty much that like modern 3E and later D and D approach to to a species that ha you know you have a little minor feet kind of thing that would work fine for this too. Um, I think the way Jonathan Walton handles it in Planar Codex with um, heritage moves is like the best thing ever. So just stealing that completely would be a really good way to go too. Oh yeah, David's. Uh, he has a good point. He knows my game better than I do. Um, he said uh, the thought for presenting the playbooks is to call out the uh, experience triggers for each one, like half, like the top ways you get for that playbook. That's a really good idea. Yeah, that's super smart. Um, especially that first one. The the first one is always the sort of key thing. Um, same for crews. Like your first thing is always you know your smugglers do a smuggling operation. Um, so yeah, that's that's super smart. I, I I'm gonna make a note of that organization because it's really good. I thought it was interesting having those triggers be checked at the start of the next session as opposed to either when they happen or at the end of the session. Yeah. That's a really divisive thing. Some people hate that. Uh, they think it's ridiculous to do it at the beginning of the next session, but um, I found that we we end up recapping at the end to do XP if we do it at the end, and then we recap at the beginning of the next year, remind ourselves where we were. So I was like, nah, we need to recap at the beginning of the next time anyway. So let's just put XP there. But some people don't like it, and it really doesn't. It makes no difference. You can do it whenever you want. Uh, it, it's fine. Um, wow, David's got a lot of good questions here. Uh, so he says, I noticed that you get since you get to choose where to put your skills, um, that it allows for characters to be more similar, but the differences are in the experience triggers. Um, what do you think that will encourage or discourage in play? Um, yeah, the experience triggers. I mean, those are those are just keys from the Shadow of Yesterday, one of the greatest RPGs ever. Um, that I stole for Lady Blackbird and and um, 
And man, there's almost nothing better than those for XP. Like they, they're just such great drivers for um, for players to to dig into. Um, and that that's where you see a lot of different differentiation. And something I've noticed is I've made some of them intentionally conflict, um, but but kind of subtly. And different groups interpret those different ways. Like the cutter gets XP when they destroy an enemy's resource, but the uh, slide, I think, gets XP when they like co-opt or corrupt an enemy's resource. So that so those are intention theoretically, right? Where the cutter might want to destroy the enemy asset, and the slide might want to seduce or manipulate the enemy asset. Um, but what I've noticed is some groups some groups are naturally like antagonistic with each other. They create a doesn't really get along, and they're constantly sniping at each other and in character, you know. And so it's uh, those things are intention, and other groups just naturally fall into line and become. A, oh yeah, very strong, and so it like co-opted that one, even though it, that's not quite what happened. But like the, the asset just got fucked over by them, and they and they're like, yeah, we all did it. We all fucked them over in our own way, and they they choose to like turn that into this collaborative thing instead of a mm-hmm. uh, um, something that's intention, which is interesting. It's I, that's not really the way I read those. I think they're they're definitely designed to c- cause conversations to happen at the table where. You look at your sheet and you go, whoa, 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 hang on, no. Let's just let's just burn down their drug lab, and someone else is like, we can get, we can totally use this for ourselves. Um, so yeah, that's that, that that's where I see the the playbooks diverge um, the most. And then the convergence of skills is totally by design. Like what, what I want over time is you don't know what the crew is really going to do when you start, so you, the character is fairly sketchy. And then the more you play, the more you see like, okay. We're constantly messing with spirits, so everyone start putting stuff into into book skills and you know head in that direction if you want to. Um, and having some kind of convergence where everybody ends up covering their bases a little bit, and it makes your uh, group action rolls like way better when everybody has the skill. And um, so yeah, having some kind of convergence is good. And then when you don't do that, when everyone splits off and doesn't have any overlaps, um, then you can do a lot more like solo. Uh, mm-hmm. Overcome moves when your team does stuff, and uh, put a, put a lot more stress on the team. Overcome is is not sh- super stress efficient, but it's uh, very XP efficient. It, it, specialization is very XP efficient. Um, so being being uh, broad is is obviously a slower progression. The playbook conflict we came up up against was the the lurk versus the cutter, just doing things without being noticed and destroying everything. <laughs> yeah, definitely intention there. Uh, if you know, if it, it's almost like um, the difficulty setting for your game, right? Do you want to play in hard mode? Like, okay, you can destroy everything as long as no one notices. Like, see if you can see if you can figure out a way to do that. That's that's hard mode. Uh, Jeffrey wants to know if there are any upgrades planned for the physical products. Um, since the Kickstarter is doing well, uh, a slipcase um, or a second hardcover for the compendium and stuff like that. Yeah, that it's totally possible. Um, uh, things have you know developed really fast and way more than I expected them to. So I wasn't ready. I had I thought I had planned for everything, and of course. <laughs> Things are kind of uh, out of control, so um, my my goal was to get the quick start out uh, yesterday, which I did. So now I'm gonna start investigating like all kinds of other options and stuff. So I, I can't promise anything. I don't know where that's gonna go yet, but I'm definitely looking into it and uh, well, thinking about color too, possibly. Um, I, the whole thing is black and white, I know, but spot colors and stuff like that might um, might come into the hardcover. We'll see. Um, but yeah, Jeffrey, I think that's a great idea, and uh, I'm looking into it. I- I'm also thinking about um, adding a second city expansion uh, in addition to Udrasha, just just for free, just as a as a thing, because everyone's been so awesome. Um, I-, I have one that's mostly done already, so uh, it won't it won't add a lot of overhead to the production of the thing. Um, so I'll let you know about that as soon as I can. Um, 
that one's pretty much a sure thing, though. Uh, <laughs> so you can expect that that will happen. Um, it's for uh, for Lockport, the uh, the Scoblend uh, electroplasm processing city up up north. Um, yeah, or they uh, they process process demon blood and turn it into electroplasm. It's a big chemical factory city. It's horrible. We also found it impossible to play with Scovlanders without everybody accidentally or intentionally slipping into the Nord voices from Skyrim. <laughs> <coughs> That's funny. Um, yeah, that that I mean, obviously that that was on my mind. Um, the uh, I I always slip into Scottish for whatever reason I don't know why uh, that, that's 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 my Scotlander accent. <laughs> oh yeah, Dave has an interesting question. Um, sorry, David uh, Berg, I think it is. Where is it? Uh, man, these questions are just flying by. Oh no, it's David Rothfelder. Um, this is, a, this is a fun idea. I was considering doing the beginning of session XP for the first session um, based on an invent, invented scenario that happened uh, before. Um, do you have any advice on getting players to invent a session that never existed? It's funny you say that. It, my game, Danger Patrol, that's how it starts. That's how you, that's how you start the game. Um, you, you do a thing called Previously on Danger Patrol, and everyone does a little vignette of what their character was doing before the cliffhanger. And the GM creates the current session from all those cliffhanger bits, uh, which turned out to be really hard to do and crazy um, fun, but like really improv heavy, you know, right? People tell you eight awesome things, and then you have to. It's really hard to do, um, but yeah, yeah. I think some uh, a list of questions would do it. I think if you come up came up with a few questions to ask the players that that guided them to invent something instead of say. What happened to you? You know, just have four questions. Ask them whoever you want. Ask them like, um, uh, you were nearly caught by the blue coats last week. What happened? Um, you, uh, yeah, an, an ex lover came to you uh, desperately. With a problem, you know, what what happened or whatever. And give them some kind of little prompt. Um, that might do it. Yeah, and the way they answer the question, uh, the way they dealt with that problem, like you you wouldn't play it out. You'd just say like, how did you deal with that? And then that would let you uh, choose XP on that. It's kind of like the um, um, in Elder Scrolls and those games where you put a little prologue, and that you usually you know, set your star sign and stuff based on what you did in the or whatever. Um, I think that was Elder Scrolls. Morrowind maybe. <laughs> yeah, that could be really cool. That's a good idea. Try it out. I think. Maybe. All right, I'm switching over. Chat questions. Uh, Duan, perhaps? I don't know how to pronounce your name. Roa, sorry. Um, how do you see the player's action and effect dynamic? I fear that players vying for using their max stats will spring conflicts. Yeah. Um, good question. Uh, this, this game is definitely designed. Um, that the GM is not the big center of the table ever at all. At any point. I think your mic is cutting in and out. Oh, sorry. Can, can you hear me now? Yep. Okay. I think I may have gotten too far away. Um, so, yeah, so it's like some games demand it, and then in addition to that, it's human nature to um, want to control uh, what's going on and like manage the game and make sure everyone does everything right and in my experience with certain people, not everyone does this, but with certain people if they know that it's not their responsibility to behave, they'll, they'll act out unless someone um, controls them, right? It's the parent-child dynamic, uh, which a lot of adults uh, still do, um, even when they're adults. <clears throat> and I don't like the parent-child dynamic with my peers, especially my creative peers. Um, I, I wanted an adult-to-adult -adult interaction, so I don't want to put myself in a position where I'm um, babysitting them or where I'm um, mandating like what they're allowed to do or say or whatever. So obviously there are different responsibilities at the table between the GM and the players, right? Like I, I, I enjoy the difference where as a player I get to just play my character and I don't have to invent what's inside the box or whatever like that. Like the GM does that. That's cool. When it comes to authority, 
there are a lot of ways to slice it, and this game does not put the GM in a position of authority over what's uh, allowed uh, in the game. <laughs> so if the players want to always use their best score or whatever, um, that's their prerogative, and the game will be about those things, and that that's totally fine. Uh, there isn't real, you know, there is a mechanical feature here where the, the dice system in this game has hugely diminishing returns. Having more dice past three or four really doesn't help you much at all, and then especially five or six, it just tanks, and you could just pile on dice forever. It doesn't matter at that point. <clears throat> um, you never really get that high uh, with dice usually, but um, when we're talking the difference between one or two or two or three, uh, it, it kind of, it's not a huge deal. Um, and there, that power dynamic of, you know, they're always rolling their best moves, they're, you know, my, my, my obstacles that I've created are being easily defeated, and all that is not part of this game. You, you don't have to create challenges for the group and then hope they engage with them, and then hope they turn out just right so the pacing is good, and they just barely beat the guy at hour three of the session and stuff like that. You don't have to do any of that. Um, you just just follow the tra train of consequences, and when they uh, get lucky, which they might, and put themselves in a position of power too soon, uh, that's not good. Um, that uh, That's really bad. And every time that happens in our, they go, why did, why did we do this? Why? Why did we We're screwed. Um, we, can't, uh, we can't possibly get with this. So screwed. Um, so yeah, it's, uh, I'm trying to make this explicit in the text. It's it's something that's a little foreign to, to gamer dumb, I think, this idea that, um, the players are just as responsible for the tone and the and the mm -hmm. consequences of the game as the GM. So when they when they do something stupid, or introduce something silly, or use the same thing over and over again and make their character look uh, foolish, that's just on them. And they they, they are, it's completely up to them uh, how they want to how they want to approach that. So, you know, you you may not want to have that conversation with your group, and you may not want to. Uh, be responsible for changing the dynamic between real life humans uh, if, if a different one's been established. But that's that's part of what I'm trying to do with the game design is is just take that out of the mix um, and and just put it in the players' hands and <clears throat> not just in this punitive uh, everybody try to grow up way, but also in a in a constructive way. Like a lot of what the players do in Blades in the Dark is traditionally what a GM does in a traditional game. They choose which skill to roll, they uh, get to ultimately decide what effects happen to them or not. Um, they choose what missions, what the missions are and which ones to go on. So I'm a little bit trying to create, create some training wheels for GMs by, if you play Blades in the Dark for three or four sessions, you've practiced choosing the right skill for the right situation, you've practiced uh, pursuing an interesting mission, um, you practice judging a fictional situation to see if it's desperate, risky, or controlled, which a lot of games have, even though they don't call it that. Um, so yeah, I'm hoping that just playing the game will uh, exercise some GM muscles and uh, make people feel a little more comfortable about doing that. And then the, there's a GM round robin um, method in the in the game, and uh, a, a couple different ones, so you can swap out GMing. Um, Based on certain milestones, like when you move when you move tiers, mm -hmm. uh, or you can switch out GMing when um, using the teamwork mechanic, where everybody has a skill and uh, someone's on point, everyone else is back up, and someone else their character fades, uh, and when they're faded, they they play the GM, and then when you switch um, switch team positions, um, you can switch GMs too if you want. And that one's just a kind of selfish uh, design because <laughs> I. I GM a lot, and I was like, ah, it'd be fun to just, like, make a character and go on the missions, too. I think I found it... I found, it, I found it, like, refreshing, like, you saying that stuff explicitly about the um, the players being responsible for the tone of the game, and I kind... In, 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 the, in the text there, and kind of, like, just treating, I think, everybody like an adult, I think, hopefully... I, like, I enjoyed that. Cool. Well, I, there's definitely more that'll be in there on, in that direction. 
I, there, there's probably going to be a little essay a little bit about what I just said about um, the human dynamic that's involved just to just to acknowledge it that it's it's a real thing and it may not be super easy uh, to deal with at your table. So there's other ways to do it. If you if you want to back off from that and just have the GM pick the skills and stuff, you can totally play it that way. But um, it'll give you the opportunity to push things too if you want to push it. Um, David uh, Rothfeder asks, uh, I noticed that the game focuses more on actions than on emotional stakes. Was this uh, your intention? Are there any mechanics that encourage decisions based on emotion rather than results? Yeah, really good question, David. You have a lot of good questions tonight. Um, yeah, uh, the, the main, Devil's Bargain is definitely the main one. Um, and the more you play uh, with the same group and the same characters, the Devil's Bargains can get really emotional because uh, you because you know just exactly the thing that they really, you know, like as a player sometimes, the thing they really don't want you to offer or like what their character holds really dear or whatever. Um, and th there's a fun dynamic that comes out of that where there's a guy in our group that is, is very well known for always taking the Devil's Bargain uh, no matter how preposterous. And th that's the reason why the mechanic exists because I started doing it um, sort of impromptu before that was a mechanic. And Ryan would always, always, always take it uh, and escalate the game to these insane places. But the demon gets to, you know, merge with your soul. He's like, whatever, give me the dot. Uh, so the game, you know, wins all these crazy places because of that. But uh, over time, like, we started to realize, like, oh, okay, it's not just, these bargains aren't just... Uh, you you ruin your knife, or <clears throat> you suffer stress, or you take an injury, or some stuff like that. They can be, you know, um, yeah, you can manipulate her. You're the person you marked on your sheet as your lover. Um, you can manipulate her. Uh, she doesn't want to do this, but you can you can try. And yeah, you can have the bonus die from Devil's Bargain, but she'll never trust you again if you do this. <clears throat> uh, you can do stuff like that to just. And what's fun is. It's not just uh, the heart-wrenching, like, oh, melodrama, yeah, I'll take the die, and everything's going to be changed. There's something really fun as a player, it seems, uh, to me, watching it as the DM. Um, when they say, no, no way, I would never do that. I, I, no way will I take that bargain. And it, it, it's like a statement. You know, they're, they, they get to... Um, if they're not just playing their character moment to moment, they're like telling the whole table, like, this is what I stand for right now. Everyone listen up. I will not do this. Uh, and that can be really cool. So that, I think that's the main place it comes in. Um, the other place that it comes in sometimes is the fact that you're best, you're better at hurting people that you have relationships with in general. Um, people that match your background are more vulnerable to you. So there's there are all kinds of situations that come up where um, the easier targets are are people that you know better, um, and one of the playbooks has a particular move that specifically says that it gives you a, a bonus die for that. But um, yeah, it, it's real. That's really subtle. It doesn't come up in every game, but some some players have really noticed that. Like, oh, huh, yeah. If we want to run con games, we should probably run them on our, our people because we're way better at that. Uh, and that there's something to that that that's thematic and that can that can bring in some. some stuff. Just speak. Just speaking of devil's bargains, I, I was surprised in like in my first run of the game just to find that like they only took the devil's bargain about half the time. Like, mm -hmm. I, I I was expecting it to be much more than that, but yeah, people refused them. Yeah, it's it's weird. It, it, it again, it kind of runs counter to that gamerdom idea, right? That people just they'll do anything for dice. They'll grub for dice or whatever. Those those kind of ideas. But I won't damage your lock picks for dice. <laughs> that's <right. laughs> oh man, that's that's a fun one. Uh, the uh, the devil's bargain that messes with someone else. Um, that's that's always really good. Uh, if you if you want to sow the seeds of discord in the in the crew, that's that's, that's a good way to do it. All right, let me scroll down and look here. These questions are not in any order, which is really really strange, but. Uh, I think ones that people vote like for go to the top. Yeah, 
On the event page, they are. In the Q&A thing, they're kind of shuffled, I think. Uh, that's okay, though. We'll figure it out. All right, here we go. Uh, my girlfriend may run a game on her with her own setting. What elements do you think are essential to run Blades in the Dark in a non-ghost line setting? That's a really good question. Uh, especially if you're working on a hack uh, or a playset or something. The it's, it's a lot like hacking Apocalypse World. There's a core to it, and if you stick with that core, hacking is way easier and, and shorter and easier to, like, just mentally, conceptually easier to do. You can move outside the core and still hack the game, um, but obviously... You're taking on a design project, a bit a bigger design project when you do that. So if you want a small design project, uh, you want to to pick a setting and uh, sort of concept or pitch that plays on the characters being the proactive uh, agents in your setting, <coughs> um, rogues, so to speak. They don't have to be bad guys, but whoever is like initiating this the thing not the reactive side of it, the, the initiating side of it. That makes it easier because the game's built around that. Um, uh, oh, boy, I just lost my train of thought. Um, yeah, sorry, this is the simple version of hacking. Um, yeah, so they're, they're proactive, um, scoundrelly types, or whatever uh, in that vein. The team is, a, is important, so whatever... Everyone hangs their uh, identities on is their individual identities, but then there's some broad concept, <clears throat> or it could be very specific. But there's a concept that um, unites everybody under a common direction. So, like they're initiating things, but then as a group, they don't have to decide session to session. Like, what should we be about? You know, should should we start uh, thieves? group? Should we become a wizard thing? Or whatever. Like, that's already been decided. And so you have this really easy to answer question. When you say, what do you do now? They go, well, we're smugglers. Let's smuggle something. <clears throat> so you, it, it's better for a, a setting to have that, to have an, at least one, um, but obviously a choice is better uh, of, of a crew, of a, of a concept that all the characters fit into. Um, and then that drills down to playbooks, right, where all the playbooks are suitable for all your different crew types, including, when I say suitable, including ones that are surprising. Uh, like I was talking to Allison about this the other night about um, uh, Sparrow's Folly and the, and the Western thing. Like, you know, if, if you had a crew that was, like, running a, a brothel or something, um, like Cy Tolliver's crew in, in Deadwood, um, you know, at first glance, you might be like, well, the, like, the, the lone gunslinger playbook guy, like, he doesn't fit into that, so, yeah, you know, maybe you need to make a different set of playbooks, which you could, but I, at the same time, I think it's okay to have a few outliers like that, where the person who picks them, if they pick them, it's like picking the driver in Apocalypse World, like, you know what you're doing when you pick it. Everyone else is sort of, we're at the hard holds, we have the hard holder, and we have the gun lugger, and we have the angel, and we're all... This, this little group, and if someone picks the driver uh, in that scenario, they have a really good reason for it, and they're gonna they're gonna fit in in their own way. <laughs> so I think it's okay to have um, a little friction there, um, like when everyone chooses thieves and someone picks uh, like the hound or someone like that, who's who's obviously like better suited to be an assassin or or something. Um, that can be really that can be really great because. Uh, the crew as a whole is united in doing a thing, but then they have this this outlier guy where they can always be like, "Yeah, we're thieves, but this we, someone needs killing, Hound. Go, go assassinate him for us." Uh, and it's nice to have a little bit of um, friction there, so it's not just completely, uh, you know, like the dark. Right, every book could have been a type of thief, uh, but it'd be a little too one note. So. Um, I don't know. I still haven't written this bit of instruction, so I'm sort of ripping a little bit. But that, that's the general shape of it. Um, the proactive uh, situation where they, players can choose what to do next. Um, hanging everything on a crew concept or, or four would be ideal. 
and then a set of playbooks that all somehow fit under that those umbrellas. Uh, if you can come up with a setting that has those qualities, then hacking is purely a writing exercise. All you have to do is write a page of introduction, rename all the actions if you want to, um, decide what your vices are, decide what your crew names are, and then if you don't want to do any game design uh, work, even though all that writing is actually game design, but you know what I mean, mechanics design, if you don't want to do that, um, you can just pull existing uh, special abilities and stuff from the Blades in the Dark things and mix and match them and make new playbooks out of that. <laughs> so that's the bare minimum. Uh, and if you can make your playset work in that space, I highly recommend it. Um, if you can't, uh, like Strash is working on a thing. I, 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 maybe I shouldn't say what it is, but uh, it's, it's a little weird. And it, he went through a lot of iterations with it until um, he realized he had to, like, change the what Vice was completely, um, still filling that niche, but being something else. Um, changing what factions and crews mean, but you know, keeping those mechanics, but changing kind of what they are and what they mean in the world. Um, so yeah, once you get into that space, um, that's something I've been playing with a lot. Is you know, what if we change uh, uh, like the the on the crew sheets? You have the names of the people on your that are your thugs and stuff. If if those are ships in a fleet that you control that you know that changes things even though it's just changing Vincent's name to the USS Dauntless or whatever it, that you know it just changes what the game is and what it's about so um, I'm hoping that the, the, the structural framework of Blade of the North is is enough that you really can go through and and like uh, swap uh, terms <coughs> on the sheets and in the in this in the fictional side of things, to totally change what the game's about, but just leave the structure in place um, so that dynamic happens. However, <laughs> I will caution that um, unlike a true toolkit uh, game like GURPS or, uh, or even Apocalypse World, um, all Blades in the Dark games are, are very similar. They all have similar structure. They all have the same general thrust of this group proactively going after stuff that's above their current means, um, getting into trouble, uh, possibly not not making it um, the Firefly uh, you know, idea. So if you do cosmetic hacking to Blades in the Dark, you're, you're still going to tell that story over and over again. So that, that might not be the right framework for your thing. Uh, Blades, despite all the different cosmetic reskins that are very fun with it, um, the structure there's a little give in it, and you can do a little bit different things with it, um, but that doesn't mean it's like the, the the automatic universal RPG system or anything like that. It's very, it's pretty specific about what it does. So, um, that's something else to think about. Just to think about if if that structure fits the the concept for the game you want to make. Uh, Dylan said, Dylan's in, in uh, the Thursday group, um, first first play tester for Blades in the Dark. He says, we almost always take the devil's bargain, not for the dice, but because the bargains are usually really interesting. Uh, and I think that's a good good way to put it. Uh, and, that's, and that's a group skill, right? Uh, Role-playing game play is a skill uh, that you develop um, in general and with each game you play. And a, a Blades in the Dark skill... Uh, is is that is because it's not the GM's job to offer the devil part. It's the, it's the whole group, um, and over time, uh, the more you play with people and the more you know about them and the more times you've done that bargain, um, yeah, you, you get into these places where, like, the character wouldn't necessarily do that, and the player wouldn't necessarily want that, but it's just so good that everyone's like, man, that, that needs to happen. <laughs> that thing you just said is really good. I want to I wanna add that to our game. So let's figure out a reason why Cobb you know, does that thing, and that's usually easy to do. So, uh, yeah. It's... And, and that uh, someone asked me on um, RPG Net or somewhere about, like, do the players have narrative mechanics? Um, like a, like some story games, you know, where you like 
get the, you know, you spend a point and get to add something to the narrative or whatever. Um, and of course the answer is no, but uh, but the devil's bargain is is essentially that it's uh, it's a chance for any player to just like introduce something out of out of the blue outside their character's sphere, which is where you normally are as a player, um, and just just introduce whatever you, you think might be cool. I felt like it kind of takes the hardest part for me of running Apocalypse World, which was what to do on a, like, coming up with something cool on a 7 to 9, act under fire, and just making that everybody's job all the time. Yeah, right? Exactly. Yeah, when, you, when you've done that enough times, uh, you know, sometimes it just flows, and you're in the groove, and you're just nailing them with hard choices and stuff, and it's awesome, and sometimes you're like, uh, uh, hard choice, I don't know, uh, and yeah, it's, it's totally built for that. See what Sean Sean Nittner is here with a question. Uh, Lady Blackbird has a refresh mechanic that rewards players for having scenes of reflection, introspection, or developing relationships with each other. Uh, is there space in Blades to see the aftermath when characters have a chance to reflect on the job? Um, yes, good. Thank you, Sean. That's a good question. Uh, Strash is here. Hello, Strash. You made it back from archery. Awesome. Uh, so, um, yeah, that, yes, there is. Uh, unlike Lady Blackbird, the amount of introspection, reflection, and relationship development is, uh, it's, it has a very light hand. Um, in Lady Blackbird, it's kind of in your face. It's like, I need dice, so, hey, you, let's have a heart-to-heart. -heart. And you just, you kind of have to do it, right? Um, in Blades, it's a phase of the game, uh, typically, uh, during downtime and recovery when people indulge their vices. Um, but it's it, it's a very light touch. The game doesn't... It doesn't force you to make that introspective or make that about a relationship development. Um, it creates a space where that can happen, uh, either developing relationships with your, your friends list or your vice... Um, Trafficker, uh, or, and this is another player skill thing. I'll just, I'll just give this one away. You can, you can all be slightly more advanced blades in the dark players. Um, the, uh, <laughs> all, all of the downtime uh, roles and um, development roles and everything, those can all use the teamwork rules. So if you go and build your vice, you can get everybody to go drink, and you can all roll a group action together and and uh, make it way easier to recover, right? So that's 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 a thing you can do. And that, that is a tiny little incentive to include other people in those operations and to enlist them into what you're, what you're doing. Um, but it's definitely not as in your face as Lady Blackbird. Uh, this game, if you want the game to be about that, there's a space for you, and you can pay 50% downtime addictions and love affairs and stuff, and 50% heists. Um, or like a lot of groups, uh, including including our Thursday game, um, you can play ninety percent heists and and ten percent downtime stuff, um, which is still important and still drives parts of the game. But it's also because we have five players and we don't really have a lot of time to just like indulge everyone in their interesting downtime stuff. Um, with three players, that's much much better. You have a lot more room, a lot more space to explore those things more time essentially um, so yeah it's it, it it's there but it's not it's not like lady blackbird at all it's, uh, it's much much lighter touch um, what 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 about you Strash? have you had um, experiences with that in your games in terms of what vice and downtime is like the, the flavor of it uh, so it depends uh... There's a, a bit of a flow question because we've got the latest version that everyone's going to be familiar with and sort of older versions that emphasize things in a different aspect. Sure. Uh, but in general, what I am seeing is that when you first start, the focus is, of course, on the heists. You're worried about your position in the city. You're worried about making money. You're worried about the things that matter to you. Uh, we have a player that is so about his stash. He is saving for retirement. That's <laughs> his drive, right? Um, and then as you start you start asking some of these simple questions. You're just like, hey, so um, you didn't choose having a place to live in your hangout or in your hideout. 
So uh, where do you live? Okay, who are your neighbors? How do you interact with people? And then uh, one of the things that happened last game is uh, they got into war with Ulf Ironborn, and he beat up some of their gang. So all of a sudden, they're like, visiting them and taking them to a physiker and they're learning about these other people that care about them and now these people are actually in the line of fire and they care about them and now there's this whole development where what's happening in between the heists is super important because they have to protect their people and they have to think about things. So it, it kind of depends on where like the shift in the action is. If you're like steady on your tier, you're not at war with everyone, then you're just blowing through your vice rolls. Like maybe we're talking like we're using that to like set up some hooks and some color um, and then there are times when you know things are in the um, like in the very day <laughs> to to quote Kenny Loggins, it's danger zone, right? And and uh, it's super important to know what's going on in that downtime. So that downtime is actually about as tense as a job because you know you're you're walking through the streets, but you gotta watch your back, and maybe somebody's on you, but you're alone. You don't have teamwork. What are you gonna do? And so um, yeah, so it depends. It it shifts back and forth depending on where the action is, and it's some. It, it seems to flow organically, right? Like if people are really scared about what's going to happen in between, then you focus on that, and if they're not, then no. So. Yeah, that's cool. That makes sense. Um, that's that. I think I think that falls in in the space that I was hoping it would. Uh, it's always tricky to have two light it there, you know. It might not really happen for some groups that aren't into that, but that's okay too. Um, I, I the the this this type of game can get mired in all kinds of things that aren't jobs anyway. That I think it's okay to err a little bit on the side of just getting down to doing the job uh, as your primary activity of play. Um, I think we've all sat in enough Shadowrun games that we never did. <laughs> And just couldn't stand it anymore. So uh, yeah, if if that gets emphasized over over the um, emotional stuff, then that's that's okay with me. Got my camera stuck on me again. I don't know how that keeps happening. I want to hear David's question about the railjacks. Ah, oh, there we go. Thanks, Ross. Oh, what is where's uh, his question? I didn't see it. He just says like there are a few places where railjacks are mentioned, but according to entanglement rules, they handle sup they handle supernatural threats. This intrigues me. But can you reveal more about what a railjack is? Ah, yes, yeah. Um, they are uh, um, yeah. So they're um. They used to be called uh, line bulls. Uh, if you if you played ghost lines, uh, that's what they're called in there. Um, and I decided to change their name at some point during development. I forget why. <laughs> um, so yeah, in the, in the ghost lines universe, uh, which is the Blades in the Dark universe, Blades is a little slightly earlier. Like the all the train lines haven't been built, but that's a minor detail. Um, but there are these, these rail lines that connect the cities because out in the Deathlands it's all horrible and you don't want to travel out there. <clears throat> so the Emperor, you know, commissions this, this huge project um, and they build all these lines and thousands of people die in the construction of them and it's pretty horrible. That, that, in, in my mind, this isn't really canon, but in my mind part of the war with Scovland to get them to join the Empire was part of that. Like there were a lot of Scovlanders that died in the rail works and stuff and they were, it, it's a whole thing. Um, but uh, the trains, they travel on these electrified rails between the cities, and they're supposed to, they're electrified to drive the train and also to, to keep spirits away, but they don't work super well. Um, so there's a really shitty job you can take, which is to to be a railjack where you wear magnetic boots and a uh, gas mask, and you ride on, on the outside of the train car um, with these, like, lightning hooks, and when ghosts get entangled in the in the electrical systems of the train and try to get inside and possess people and stuff. You you rip them off and fight them uh, to keep them from doing that. <laughs> so, um, in the original Ghost Lines game, about you know half the game was doing a, a train job. You'd choose on the line map, you'd say, like, okay, we're going to ride from here to here and uh, you know do a line job. And when we arrive in Duskwall, uh, we have downtime, and you could take on a side job um, on a little chart, and some of those are like criminal operations and stuff like that. Uh, and that's a little bit where Blades in the Dark came from, because everyone 
turned out to be really interested in their side jobs and was like, I'm going to run a brothel and stuff. And we're like, dude, you, you're a freaking bull who rides on a train. Like, what are you, what are you doing? Um, so obviously a game was needed that, that satisfied the side jobs. But but uh, because the Railjacks are they're these, like, grizzled, hardened people that just face horrendous ghosts in the Deathlands every day. Um, so when they're when the trains come into town, all the Railjacks, like, sit and drink uh, and, and do drugs um, at, near the train station. And if you have bad ghost problems, you can go down there and, and hire them because they'll be like, fuck it, I'll do it, I don't care. Um, so they're, they're an option. That, that's why they're an option to get rid of uh, ghost problems. Um, and then uh, the, one of the stretch goal unlocks uh, for this Kickstarter is the, go is the Ghost Lines um, thing, but in the Blades in the Dark system. So you'll have playbooks for the different Railjack jobs, um, the anchor and the owl and the, the different things you do, and then some uh, guidelines and mechanics for doing a, a rail mission where you actually ride the rails out and fight ghosts and stuff. That'll be part of that. All right. I think, have we caught up on the questions? We might have. No, maybe. Nope. <laughs> no, we haven't. I'm going to delete some of these so we can get them out of our hair. We've answered a bunch of these. Uh, Matt Gagan has a question. If I can delete my way to it. Uh, can you talk a little bit about Allison's interest in the Old West, whether she's taken a look at Dust Devils, uh, one of my personal favorite games, and about the specific Old West setting she's developing? I can mention it briefly. She's obviously the person to ask about it, but we, we have talked about it a bit. Um, it's, uh, it's definitely in the vein of Cormac McCarthy um, style Western uh, Fairly gritty, realistic, but also with some melodrama and uh, some over the top. Character. The judge from Blood Meridian is a character that's a real touchstone. If you're familiar with that, that probably tells you everything you need to know. Um, but uh, yeah, it's it's in that space. Um, a little postmoderny for Western, I guess. Like like one of my favorites, Unforgiven. I think one of the best westerns ever. Uh, kind of in that space too. Um, we haven't played, uh, Allison hasn't played Dust Devils. Uh, we totally should, probably, before she gets to work on that. But, um, yeah, I would say it's not super far from Dust Devils in terms of tone and, and style. Um, yeah. But uh, she's the best person to talk about that. I'm probably going to do a hangout or something um, with her about it. Uh, probably all the stretch goal people, um, I'll do hangouts with them to talk about their projects so we can get it straight from, get it straight from them instead of my interpretation. But I'm super excited. Uh, obviously, Western is a really good fit for for this kind of thing, and uh, man, it's gonna be it's gonna be really good. He's a wonderful writer. Uh, Sean says I'm totally stealing Devil's Bargain for a Pathfinder game I'm about to start. <laughs> uh, I think that's all. Um, so the Pathfinder. Uh, no, it doesn't have advantage, does it? But it totally could. That would that would that would work. Um, you could have Devil's Bargain for for an advantage die. That would that would probably do it. I'd play that. For well, maybe not. <laughs> I take it back. I don't I don't want to make characters in Pathfinder. I take it back. Uh, John Edwards asks, I haven't played Blades in months. Um, I saw the early versions change quite a bit. What was the biggest surprise for you and how the game changed as it developed compared to your original inspiration? Um, yeah, the biggest, I think the biggest surprise is, you know, we we played it for so long. We played it for two years. Uh, and in, you know, many iterations uh, from the very, very simple one-die uh, placeholder system up through these branching pads where you know, the play test, online playtest group was playtesting one set of rules, and I, like, forked off a whole other version of the game uh, entirely and playtested it on my own to see if any parts of it were salvageable. Uh, 
and and they, some of them more kind of, but not really. Um, so yeah, it's gone through a lot of iterations. Um, play like play driven. That's that's how I like to do design work. I don't really like to just sit and try to think of the best option and write it down. I like to just show up at the game night and be like, what, how, what do you think we should do? Let's try this, <clears throat> and then kind of see what works in in practice. So it it took a long time to do that, but it still wasn't really there. Uh, even after all that time, we felt like the three moves that desperate risky controlled moves were. Hot, and they were always working, and everybody loved them. Um, and the the game was firing really well there. the The general shape of the of the skill system it had been the same for a while. Everybody liked that. The way you got XP based on what you did that was in place. But there's st- it was just missing this bit, and it's the most obvious thing, of course. Um, and it was even after all this all that time playing. We still had about a 50% success rate on doing the job, on on managing our time as a group, and like getting to the thing as opposed to talking about the thing. Because we, like most game groups, like just loved to talk about all the different possibilities, and blah 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 blah. And sometimes that wouldn't happen. Sometimes. We, we were super efficient and got down to things in this really tight way, and sometimes we didn't. And for some reason, that just wasn't really on my radar for a while, which, which is really stupid, right? I mean, the game is about heists. Like, the few think the first thing you would make is like a really good way to do that. But uh, it, it was it was more like we had been successful enough at it in the in our own group and and some of the other playtest groups that it wasn't this big point of friction exactly. Um, until uh, uh, in one of the game playtest sessions, Brandon, one of the playtesters, well, he was he was just like he had had it. He was like, you know what? This I just we just spent too much time planning. We spent too much time talking. I just want to do the freaking things. Um, and so I I made that my design goal for that for that phase of iteration. I'm like, okay, I'm I'm not coming back to this group unless until I solve this problem. And uh, it was already there, like the regiment, uh, this Apocalypse World hack that Paul Riddle and I were working on, the regiment has battle plans, which are very similar to the planning mechanic in um, Blades, but I didn't go back to that and, and look at that and use it. It, it, it was just sort of in my uh, sort of lexicon. <clears throat> so when I reached for something to, to solve the problem with, I, my subconscious just sort of picked something similar to that. And uh, it turned out to be really good. And that, that was a bit of a surprise that it it was such a late addition and such a such a good solution. It really solved that particular problem in such a good way, and it's something I think is exportable to all games that do this. If you don't buy and play Blades in the Dark, the next time you play Shadowrun, you can use the planning system from Blades in the Dark, and it'll be it'll be awesome. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I I think it's weird. It's it's weird that that isn't just how gaming is done in my mind now. Like it just feels. <laughs> natural to me. And, of course, you still have the option to plan as much as you want. If you really want to, like, you can totally do that. It's fine. Um, but it, it gives everybody an easy out to raise their hand and go, enough, 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 enough. Let's just pick one and, and do it. Um, so, that, I guess that was probably the biggest surprise. Uh, yeah. Oh. So many questions. Um, do I consider this game an apocalypse world hack? Good. Yeah. Once again, David Rothfeder. Good. Great question. Uh, yeah, I think. Um, I mean, to call it a hack it gives the wrong marketing impression because no one who wants to play Apocalypse World is gonna pick this up and go, "Yay, I'm playing Apocalypse World." It's it's not, it's just different. Um, but Murderous Ghosts is an Apocalypse World hack. Uh, so, you know, if you've, if you've played Murderous Ghosts, you, you kind of know what I mean. Like, the, the, the core of that is um, it reaches deep down. So, yeah, like, for me as a designer, I built on what Vincent made to make this game. So, uh, and Clinton and Ron and Matt and a bunch of other people, too. Um, but very much built on what Vincent made. So, so in that sense, yeah. But, but no, it's not. It's not a hack the way Dungeon World is an Apocalypse World hack, right? It's not. Um, it doesn't take the the 
engine of Apocalypse World and, and hack that engine. Um, this is this is just like internalizing what Apocalypse World was, playing it for m many years and at many sessions, and that inevitably just you know informed what I was making. Uh, and I, and, I, and honestly, now as a designer, I think if, if you're conversant in Apocalypse World as a game designer, I don't think it, you can get away from it. It's uh, so. Would you say it's influenced rather than a hack? Yeah, I mean, yeah. Uh, I, I have I have some minor quibbles with the word hack that we could have a whole thing about um, that I never mentioned because I don't like definition wars. <laughs> uh, I think they're stupid. But uh, in light of certain recent conversations about what's real game design and what isn't and all that nonsense, um, uh, yeah, like... Uh, you know... What 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 I want is for every is for people to like the the reason I like the word hack is it's low stakes. People who are intimidated by game design are often not intimidated by the idea of hacking something, um, and I think that is hugely valuable and can be leveraged and to attract first time designers and say, look, if you you don't have to start from scratch. You just have to hack this thing. And the secret and Vincent said as much recently on a on a podcast interview with with Sean. I think um, the sort of secret there is. Once you start doing that level of game design, you end up doing the whole hog. Like, it it snowballs, and you realize this isn't solving the problem the way you thought, and you start exploring new avenues, and you inevitably, you know, start doing the, the bigger, harder work of design. Um, so, yeah, I think a word that is that, the word that's like, no, it's okay, it's just a hack. Like, you can you can do it, it's fine. That's super useful. Um, but, yeah, like, from, from a marketing point of view, no. Uh, this is not the Power by the Apocalypse logo is not going to be on my game, um, and uh, and that's not because I'm trying to distance myself from Vincent or whatever. I owe I owe a lot, uh, almost all of my game design chops to Vincent. So, um, but yeah, uh, yeah. In that sense, no, not a. It, like it sort of reminds me of like what you were talking about about the the planning moves like how like you know those are now that you've got them why would you run anything else without them it's like I feel like there's like certain bits of game design like in the, in the one from Apocalypse World I think said being like moves that trigger on like on specific fictional circumstances it's like why like now that you see that why would you do something without that like now that you have these keys why would you write a game that doesn't use these keys for advancement absolutely yeah I I think it's uh. It's it's good technology, you know, in some base way. Like, there's you know, there's there's a there's a good way to to get your base when you're punching, right? Like, regardless of what style you train or whatever, there, there's just going to be a thing that you, that everybody kind of does. And once that thing's discovered, it it requires a lot of work and experimentation and insight to find something else that's even just as good, and then to find something better is like a huge, a huge achievement. So. Yeah, I, I, and and I don't think Vincent necessarily was the originator of those concepts per se, but um, he definitely like uh, put them in a form that was accessible and 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 there and obviously it originated stuff too. But um, it's always hard to trace like true origins, you know. But yeah, um, those things are just so compelling. Uh, keys especially, keys are like <laughs> I. I, I've told this anecdote uh, before, but I'll I'll tell it real fast. Clinton, um, I met him at this the Seattle Gamer Meetup um, uh, online. I when I was looking for a group in Seattle one night. I typed Feng Shui, uh, Seattle Gamer or whatever into a search engine, and this was in like '99 or something. I think. Um, and it showed me Seattle Gamer as a symbol. It's like m a weekly meetup thing. So I just went to it, uh, not knowing anybody, and uh, it was in the U District, right, right where, where I live now. And um, this uh, this group of people was there, at school, and they did the donut like everyone's. I'm running this time. I'm running this night. They, you know, paired off and grouped off into things. And Clinton was there, and he said, "You know, like, I'm playtesting my role playing game." And I was like, "Oh my god, this is gonna be awful." Uh, but I didn't know anyone, so I ended up in Clinton's game. Me and uh, this guy Dan, uh, who I didn't know, we didn't know each other. <laughs> and we went back in the room, and he gave us the character sheets, he gave us the brief, he taught us how the dice rolling worked, and he taught us how keys worked. 
And we kind of looked at each other sideways. And he's like, okay, I'm going to go out and have a cigarette. You guys, like, choose your keys and stuff for your, uh, for your characters. And we sat there and we were like, he doesn't know what he's doing. Like, there's a thing in here where it's just the two of us. We can take the key of fraternity. We get XP every time we're in a scene together, and that's going to happen every scene. Like, we're totally going to break this guy's game, and this is going to be such a good play test for him. He doesn't know what he's doing. And and Dan was like, yeah, and I'm going to play this, like, big, strong barbarian dude, and I'm going to take a key where I get experience, like, every time I hit a dude or fight a guy, and I'm going to do that all night. It's going to be awesome. I was like, yeah. And so we're just we're just laughing uh, to each other, like, ha, 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 we've totally, like, found this loophole in his game where we're just going to level up super fast and we're going to get all this XP. And he comes back in and is like, so, what did you make? And we're sort of like, yeah, tell him, you know, tell him what you did. And we tell him, and he's like, awesome, that sounds great. Like, what? yeah, let's, let's do this. <laughs> and we're like, what? <laughs> what you can't make a role-playing game where we just get all the XP for playing our characters? Like, this is ridiculous. And, of course, it was amazing, and Dan, like, killed a guy with a crocodile. And, it, you know, it was, it was super fun, and we just had the best time. Um, and, our, and our minds were expanded. We were like, oh, yeah, of course, of course this is how it works. Of course. You pick your rewards, you go after them, you get rewarded, you know. And then, of course, that game has Transcendence, which is the great, the great balancing act there where you, you run out of room. You know, you level up and transcend, and your character, you know, retires, and you make someone new. Um, so brilliant, yeah, yeah. So that, that that that's how I that's how I met everybody. I met Clinton that night, and then through through him, like was introduced to all the other indie people. But uh, very first session of Shadow of Yesterday, we thought we thought we had broken it, but we were naive. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's. Enough enough anecdotes for me. We got to fire through these. Uh, da, 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 da. Oh, Jeffrey wants to say a practical question here about uh, when you talk about getting the source files for hacking, what software are we going to need to utilize them? Um, INDD? Yeah, so all of my stuff is Creative Adobe, Creative Suite, uh, InDesign, Photoshop, and Illustrator. Um, there are some open source programs that I believe can open those file types. I think I haven't ever used them myself. I don't know anything about that. Um, I, I endeavor to sh save them in every kind of format possible so they're potentially openable by various things. But all I can say for sure right now is um, InDesign, Photoshop, and uh, Illustrator. The, the actual layout files are, are InDesign, but the maps and are Photoshop and Illustrator files. So, um, I, I, so I can do some generic formats, like the maps can be EPSs or whatever, so you can open them in whatever. Um, but I, for with InDesign especially, it's uh, I Scribus might be able to open them though, so that's something to check out. Uh, I think. But regardless, I will do everything I can to make them as accessible as possible. Um, if you feel like you're not going to be able to do that and not be able to open the files, then you know maybe don't get that. Get that tier. It's the nature of software. I, I, I'll try as hard as I can, but who knows. Uh, what do you guys think? Do you want to choose the question? From the well, what's the race abilities question by D Dylan is asking? Oh, uh, I see. Yeah. Um, oh, he just jumped. Come back. Uh, yeah, he wants me to mention briefly how we handled the Tykerosi racial traits on Thursday nights. Um, yeah, two of the characters in our Thursday game are from Tykeros, the, the weird island off in the middle of nowhere that supposedly people have demon blood or whatever. Um, that's where that came from. Uh, there, there wasn't anything in the, in the notes at that point. Um, when Ryan was like, I'll be from Tykeros, what's that like? I was like, I don't know. Uh, it's no one's from there. You're an outsider. Can, like, can people tell? Do you look like the locals? Do you look different? I was like, I don't know. And I, for, for whatever reason, I said, well, I, they say that people from Tycros have uh, demon blood. Is that true? Is that just a just a horrible slur? 
He's like, no, yeah, that's true, yeah, yeah. I'm like, okay, so uh, do you have some sort of demonic telltale? Like, can people tell when they look at you that you're a demon, or do you just look like a human? He's like, no, they can tell. <laughs> I'm like, okay, what? How can they tell? He's like, well, instead of hair, I have like black feathers, uh, and then instead of fingernails, I have these like inch-long talons come out like this. Like, oh yeah, well that, yeah, they can tell. That'll do it. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, so that is a that's a very soft trait, right? Like it's a look. Um, but when his character gets disarmed and grapples the thug on the balcony, and they roll around fighting for position, you know, Ryan can say, "I rake him across the face with my talons," which normal people can't say that. So. Um, there, there is, there's this little bit of leverage there that, uh, and, it, and it works both ways, right? Like, when he needs to go to the fancy party that isn't a masquerade, um, you know, we say, dude, you have feathers for hair and talons, like, what are you going to do? This is, this is going to be an issue. Clearly, if it's a masquerade, you need a bird person costume. <laughs> That's right. You need to make it a masquerade party. Put social pressure on them so they change the rules. There you go. The social plan. Mm-hmm. The least used plan in the game. <laughs> Actually, it was, it was this close to happening last game. They, they, uh, they knew of a party where they were going to steal a ruby because my group's thieves right now. So That's cool. Yeah. It's a really powerful plan. If you have the right characters, um, you know, all the physical plans depend on, you know, this, this like, constraint of some kind or another. But the social plans, if you have the leverage and you know the person, you can you can overcome a lot of obstacles. Like, instead of dealing with this problem with violence or something, you can make it so they don't want to fight you anymore. You know, it's obviously a, a very powerful move. Um, I mean, I think it's true in real life, too. Like, <laughs> like, if there's someone powerful, it's easier to get their power by befriending them than by stealing it from them. Yep, exactly. Okay. Sorry, it's taking me so long to go through these. The deleting process is like hanging for some reason for me, so I gotta sc scroll really slowly. Uh, David, David Burke has a, a good question um, that touches on something we said earlier. I said uh, you might possibly succeed in advancing the efforts uh, in advancing your crew, and possibly not. Um, and he wants to know what determines this. Is it is it the outcome of the dice, rules mastery, fictional positioning, something else? Um, yeah, it's all that. Uh, it's a Something I've done as a GM for a long time that works really well for me is to not create um, particular scenarios or challenges for... Uh, I know you do this too, David. I'm sure you're familiar with this idea, of course. But, um, you know, to just present a situation and, and let the players deal with it how they want. And then the, the extra little notch on that that works really well for me is to present a sort of unsolvable or unwinnable situation to the players. At least, I mean, unwinnable, not in the sense that I've sat down and made sure it's unwinnable, but just in the in the abstract. Like, this is not something you should be able to do in general. Uh, and present that as the thing that they're going to try to accomplish. And then, and then that kicks off uh, creative thinking. Uh, um, Fast Company just did an article, actually, about this. Uh, about, like, how to, how to make your employees creative. And the, the number one thing they mentioned in the article was... Uh, set unreasonable expectations and I and I think that that's a key to creativity, right? Like as soon as as soon as you hear like um, well you, you probably can't do this, then it, someone goes, Well, but well but hang on. What if we did blah blah blah, you know, and it starts to engage that problem solving creative mind. Um, so yeah, so the the you you may or may not succeed at rising to the to the top of the faction to your thing is kind of that. It's a I'm going to give you the bare minimum character that can that can try to do this, but certainly not a character that can do it. And it's the 
group's job to turn the starting characters into characters, which which you may or may not do before you have to retire, and to position your crew so that they can do it, which you may or may not do before they're destroyed by their rivals. So, um, I guess I wouldn't say dice luck is a huge factor. I mean, obviously that's a part of the game, but. Um, Smart play in the in the fictional positioning sense is probably the main thing. Uh, there isn't a lot of rules mastery to the game. Um, it, it, after a few sessions, a couple sessions, you've seen it all and figured it all out. But um, yeah, but like, what what should we do next? Um, you know, which plan against whom for what gain? That that series of of decisions is hugely important uh, to your eventual. Um, position, but not in a not in a uh, board gamey sense. Like, where each turn, uh, you know, is this huge deciding factor. You can always recover from bad outcomes, um, or or lose uh, good outcomes to future problems. Um, so yeah, it's it, to me it feels much more like chess. Like, where, from where we're starting, the end state is so many interactions from now that there's almost no way to guess uh, how we're going to end up, um, and the only way to find out is to play. So. I, with with some caution, I I present the game that way to say it's your job to rise to the top of the ladder. That's a little disingenuous um, because you don't lose the game if you don't if you fail to do it. Um, the the point of the game is to try to do that and then see what happens when you try. So uh, not not getting there isn't is just as fun as getting there. It's just a different outcome. Can I ask something? Yeah, yeah. So, sort of something I've been, you know, it's an issue with our with our play group. How well does this game handle like, like, like players who can't make it every session? Mm. Yes. Uh, very well, actually. Um, the 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 focus on the crew and the the little bit of um, interaction with like uh, the background characters you recruit. If you have thugs or shadows or something. <laughs> creates a little pool of characters, um, and that makes it a lot easier to uh, drop in and out in general. Um, if if you have if like if the normal group isn't there, if you have a smaller set, then obviously you just focus on on those people. <clears throat> the vice and downtime stuff gives you an easy out. You know, we, that's what we always say. We're like, oh yeah, Grover is he's all, he's passed out. You know, he had a bender last weekend. He's not available. Um, and then if for some reason you have extra people, uh, you can just pull one of your NPCs out of the roster. Like, oh, let's make Vincent real quick. He's probably a cutter. Uh, you know, you can play him. And there's some history there. You don't have to figure out, like, how do we meet this guy? And why are you joining our team? And all those typical gaming problems. Um, there's still that issue of, like, getting them up to speed on what you're doing. But you can probably skip that, too, and just be like, you're good with a knife. We're going on a job to murder this guy. Let's do it. And I'll be like, cool, fine. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, uh, it wasn't initially designed to for that purpose because my groups are typically pretty stable, and that's not something I see a lot. Uh, but uh, it just ha it just happened to work out that it's it's very good for rotating rotating groups. Um, so yeah, I've I've never heard of any issues in that space. Have you done that at all, Strash? Have you had Sorry, I was muted for a second. So uh, there's a couple of things to note here. Uh, the game is very organic with this because uh, when you indulge your vice, you can overindulge, and then you can like go on bender and appear for a couple weeks. So having this rotating cast characters is uh, is pretty solid. And it's also kind of beneficial because sometimes uh, you know you, you need a whisper for a job. You desperately need one, and if somebody's not playing one regularly, then you should have one that you worked with before, and you kind of know. Uh, the only issue that I can think of is with the current way that uh, the XP is done at the beginning of the session. You definitely want either people there or a sheet there that you can fill in. Because if somebody skips, you want to make sure that they get their advancements. Because if they aren't there this week, then they're not going to get it next week. So um, that's the only thing that you should keep in mind or have somebody uh, fill out and then note that they get a training or something. But uh, for the most part, it seems very smooth. Cool.
Tune, come back. Okay. <laughs> David wants to know, has anyone talked about doing a hack about new ghosts forming a crew playable in the game world? Uh, yes, it is. Um, it's, uh, having crews based on ghosts is a pretty cool concept. I hadn't thought about that. Uh, the core game has a, a section on death and meaning and stuff like that. that it, like if you want to make trauma reason a little more, have more teeth in the game a little bit instead of just like, oh, I take strength. Um, there's, there's a little section about how to like introduce uh, some more um, sort of consequential things like that, including dying and including the coming of character. Uh, so, yeah. Um, oh, my mic is cutting in and out. Sorry. I mean, I'm just gonna put on my headset. I'll be right back. Talk about being ghosts. Uh, so, all right, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll add a thing. Uh, so, funny story, uh, one of the characters in my game, uh, in my long playtest that happened, uh, actually, he, uh, he had some whisper abilities, and then he fell over, and he, he got popped out of his own body, and from that point on, his soul was a little loose. So, every once in a while, he would just slip out of his body. So, actually, what was really interesting was that I sat down, and then one week, I just left a little note that said, here are four abilities in a new category uh, called, like, Spectre, and you can practice these abilities, and then you can use them when, you know, you're out of your body. And so, all of a sudden, he stopped spending XP on the abilities that you would expect him to spend XP on, and just started developing, like, these abilities. And for a while... Nothing ever happened of it, but then there was this one job where he fought some whisper, and again, his, his ghost got popped out of his body, and all of a sudden he's like, oh, check what I can do, and it was <laughs> awesome. So, uh, in, in that sense, the game is actually very encouraging. The, the template is very simple, and if you come up with a cool idea like that on the fly, like if a character's like, so what happens when I'm a ghost? I'm like, oh, uh, well, that's easy enough. It looks like we put four abilities in that category, and we just go. And so... Uh, <laughs> I think awesome. it's, it's definitely something you can do, especially on the fly. Uh, and if that's what you want to do in your game, then go for it. Nice. Yeah. I'm. I'm. I'm hoping that that more ghost play will be a thing. Uh, and uh, we were talking on RPG Net today about that, about um, death and and encouraging, you know. Building a culture of play a little bit around players who are invested in in sort of good outcome, not not beneficial outcomes, but but um, outcomes that feel cool fictionally or or feel good or are, are the right tone or what they want in the game. And sometimes that's you know when when your character dies in a in a perfect way or in just a thematically perfect way, like in a meaningless gutter somewhere that no one cares about, like. Yeah, of course you can take the stress instead, um, and sometimes that's what you should do. Um, but other times it just feels right, you know. And and creating that culture of what we can do that always, always fighting tooth and nail for everything. Um, but having that sense of like, yeah, I do die. They totally get me. They th this I fucked up. This is where they get me. I die here. Um, I'm hoping that having the ghost out will will maybe give a little bit of incentive for people who don't really want to quit playing that character or have, uh, give them a soft landing into um, taking the hit, maybe. Um, Michael Atlin has a question about trauma, and, and I think he started designing a hack in his question here. Um, he said, I want to put names to trauma, so, you know, at first you lose restful sleep, uh, and then your reputation or safety or your health or something each time you mark one off. Um, I'm really interested in decisions resulting in permanent loss. Uh, yeah, that's that's beautiful. Uh, Apocalypse World has abilities, um, which uh, which are kind of that same idea, right? You take these permanent scars uh, that, and uh, Dungeon World does it too, I think. Um, 
yeah, that's a that's a cool idea for a, a mechanic hack there uh, to actually name your trauma boxes um, with something you know meaningful and shakes. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, and that's I'm not I wasn't going quite in that direction with my idea for like permanent permanent uh, effects, um, lasting effects that you actually can't recover from, but. Uh, tying them to trauma is a really cool idea. So, um, yeah, I, that's something worth exploring. I'll I'll think about it for sure. Uh, and if you're doing any hack work, that's that's a cool thing to try. I just want to look at the failed notches in a, unknown armies, the things you, the, th- the things you get when you you know fail on the very stress meters. Yes, yes, totally. Oh man, one of the best mechanics in RPGs. Jeez. It's Beautiful. also it's a call out in the art a lot. I think. Uh, one of the things that I really love about some of the evil conversions to art, I've mentioned this to you before, but it's something that uh, became even more kind of like viscerally visible, particularly looking at some of the finished art that you put up on the Kickstarter, is the fact that you can tell that someone is blade by the scars they carry. Like, nobody is this, you know, white toothed uh, adventurer type. Like, everyone is marked by the experiences that they have to suffer in order to make it to the top. And you can see it on them, like, physically. And so I think uh, I think that if you do something like that, particularly with uh, uh, with marks from trauma, it's definitely something that that could be cool and very much gives your character kind of like a uh, a thumbprint, like a unique pattern, something that you know you carry with you and sort of tells a story. So kind of a yeah. cool idea there. This whole pattern of jobs into um, trauma and. Also, um, like the, the 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 sort of downtime between, like, has a r- reminds me in a really weird way of Bliss Stage. Oh yeah, like, it's like that's it's a totally different game, but like that pattern is the same. <sighs> yes, one of my favorite game designs. Uh, I I'm sure I was riffing on Bliss Stage somewhere deep in my mind when I was working on this. Uh, uh, and also uh, Strauss's game Atlas Reckoning. We were we were playtesting it uh, during. Uh, during working on blades, and uh, it also has a really cool, um, like, you know, action downtime uh, structure uh, and and stress relief too. Um, which we were talking about Lady Blackbird earlier, and how this game wasn't the the emo stress relief game, but Atlas Reckoning totally is. It has it has super punch you in the heart stress recovery <laughs> systems that if that's what you want to play, uh, and who doesn't. Um, that's that's where you're gonna get that. It's it's fucking it's so good. Uh, yeah, yeah. So uh, yeah, maybe that's a future hack. If you really want the this like the serious um, emo stress relief, really play Atlas Reckoning, then play Blades in the Dark, and like mash them up together. <laughs> You'll get something out of that. <laughs> what's uh what's do you want to say a word about Atlas? Uh, like where yeah, it's, you, this, you know. this is really a blade hangout, but uh, right, well, you know. keep an eye for it. It's gonna be awesome. It's a uh, Pacific Rumi. It's coming. Uh, the the big beta or second beta is almost done. So yes, I can't wait. Uh, it's super fun. Although I, I will tell you something, uh, working with blades and running the playtests and really kind of having my head in the spaces is uh, is distracting me largely because every time I'm like, all right, tonight I'm gonna work on. Ooh, hey, there's this idea I had for a hack, and so <laughs> uh, yeah, I I I am already working on the the black company one that uh, is gonna be dark fantasy. It's gonna be like bands of uh, small bands of armies that are fighting against these like. Awful sorcerer kings and and, and, and things. Uh, but uh, I've sketched up notes. I think I, I already sent you the uh, <laughs> the one pitch for a, a Dune like game. And and okay. even before, even before I was done with it, even before I was done with it, I was like, oh, the blasters in the dark, kind of a space off for a hack. <laughs> <laughs> I I mentioned it earlier, but I didn't say it was based on Dune because I didn't know if you wanted to to mention that yet, but, uh, but yes, I, uh, oh man. Well, spoilers for whoever watches this far. Uh, I can't wait, can't wait for that one. That's going to be super good. I love Dune. And Strauss's version of Dune, especially. Uh, oh yeah, Dylan reminds me that uh, in one of the very early sessions, uh, they didn't become a ghost, but one of the characters became a vampire. Um, like right away is one of the first things that happened. 
forgot about that. And vampires in your world, are people who have been possessed by ghosts for a while? That's one way it can happen. Yeah, um, it, it, the, it's open to interpretation, but we kind of define it as any time you have a, a dead body with a spirit uh, and animating the body. <laughs> um, it's, it's technically a vampire, uh, but how it got to that point is it's up for grabs. And, and what it means to be one is also totally... I think we actually had blood drinking in ours, but but you can do whatever you want. All right. Well, let's do a few more before we wrap up. I'm going to check the, the other thread to make sure we're not missing a bunch of questions. <laughs> oh, boy. Yeah. All right. David's got some here. Oh, geez. There's a bunch. Okay. Uh, David says, let's say my crew goes after a few scores, pisses off one faction, aids another, gets resources valued by another faction, etc. Which elements of these changing relationships are tracked mechanically and how? Uh, yes. So the main way that's tracked is on the faction ladder. It's on the crew sheet. All the factions are listed and they have little positive and negative tick marks next to them, which shows your status level, uh, up the levels of being positive and down the levels of being negative. Yes, sorry, uh, I didn't give you focus there. Um, <laughs> so, uh, uh, and that also lists the faction's tier level, which is essentially their scale, like how much they, they can muster, and then their hold, which is um, how hard it is for them, how hard it is for someone to uh, knock them off their tier, basically, their hold on their tier. So those those features change the most when you do these jobs. You're going to improve or, or degrade your relationship with factions by what you do. You're going to improve or degrade your hold and their hold on stuff as you do it. Um, that's the main way that gets tracked. There is a resource thing. Uh, Dave Turner and I had a really productive conversation today in this direction, and the little faction write-ups in the quick start, you can see like each faction has its current clock project that it's working on, like, we're, we want to destroy this other gang, and we can do it in these eight moves, we can fill up this, this clock, um, and it, it lists their notable NPCs, uh, the situation they're currently in, the thing they care about the most right now, <clears throat> and it also lists some notable assets. Right now, that's just a list, it says, like, you know, they have a, a trio of deadly swordsmen, they have a master alchemist, they have a large gang of brutal cutthroats, or stuff like that. Um, I'm tweeting that just a little bit. That that set is now going to have little boxes next to each one um, so that when the players or other factions murder those guys, you check them off and they're gone. Uh, and also, each faction is going to have a little um, reserve of coin, uh, a little amount of money, uh, one, two, or three, or four, or whatever, based on their tier, um, and some other factors. And that the GM uh, can spend those to replenish uh, assets that get taken out, uh, and also to buy new ones, and also to um, <coughs> gain hold or stuff, uh, or whatever. So that, that'll be a little dynamic thing um, that you can do, you know, in the fiction when the players are like, fuck it, they have a master assassin, let's take that guy out, he's too, he's too big a problem. They can permanently get rid of that guy. Uh, and But then the faction can hire a new one, it's just going to cost all their money, or you know, uh -huh. some, that, that kind of scenario can be in play. But it, the one thing I'm trying to do with, with the Blades factions is they are not, like, fully fleshed out things, you know? Like, Chicago by Night, the, the masterpiece vampire uh, supplement, right? That, that just, like, changed gaming for, for a lot of people that showed, like, how to do relationship maps and how all the different factions in the Chicago vampire world were all connected, and it's an amazing book. It's, like, still, if you can get a copy to this day, it's awesome. I, I don't know what the further editions are like. I think they changed a bunch of stuff, but the original anyway is amazing. And um, But issue I always have with it is it's like 300 pages long. Or so. It's huge. Uh, and it's just filled with tons of information. It's so hard to get through and digest and, and like remember. And um, If you can do that, it's awesome because it's filled with wonderful writing. It's, it's really good. But I kind of wanted to do that in the like easiest, cheapest way possible. So 
each faction only has to need, needs enough material to survive, you know, basically one encounter with the PCs, essentially. Um, and their other stuff, like, sure, they might be this big group. Like, one of the factions is the Duskwall City Council, and they probably have all kinds of resources and all kinds of plans and goals and stuff. But we don't need to keep track of all that. It doesn't matter. All that matters is one thing, that when the PCs interact with them, it's about this thing, and it's about these resources. And when those things get resolved, that faction, like, is you use them? You don't. You, you know. And if they if they remain important, obviously you can go to the trouble of trading new stuff and writing your own material and whatever. But um, I want to I want to give you that tool, but in a really digestible, fast, easy form. Um, because with twenty four factions that each have a thing they are trying to accomplish, and they're all at cross purposes, you will never run out. You you can play in Duskwall forever. <laughs> you will never run out of material. Uh, even if the group decides we're going to take them all down one by one, like you will never run out. So, yeah, um, that's that's the goal there. Uh, there's some mechanical things you track, but they're very lightweight and they're meant for um, almost one-off uh, interactions. Um, and then when things become relationships over time, you know, obviously you can invest in uh, making them more real. And that usually is what happens with allies. Uh, with enemies, you know, it tends to be an all-or-nothing case. They one side or the other gets gets wiped. <laughs> um, but with allies, we've had a lot of great relationships develop, and NPCs become really important, and potentials for NPCs to join the crew, you know, like, that guy's awesome, like, he, let's get him on our team, and that, that kind of stuff. It also seems like this game has the potential of doing that thing that, like, I feel like a bunch of people tried to do with d and it never worked, of just, like, running multiple parties, like, at the same time in the same world, it seems like, you know, if, if, if like, you're in two games that, like, meet, like, in, like you each meet once a week, you could actually have them in the same world doing things that affect each other, and, like, it would, might actually mechanically make sense, like it never did in D&D. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was always up to, like, the, the mechanic was have an amazing GM, uh, which is which is fine, but uh, not it's hard to, hard to make that into a product. Um I actually ran our really long-running Apocalypse World game, which was uh, 80, 88 sessions. Um, but but it, yeah, everyone is like, you can't play Apocalypse World for 88 sessions. That's ridiculous, which is true. Um, the reason it was 88 sessions was it was... it was th- that I ran 88 sessions for three different groups that eventually became two different groups that, that, that went through two or three character churns of, you know, changing playbooks and making a new character and playing a second character and all those later stage um, Apocalypse World things. Uh, and they were all in the same place. They, we, we made a map and they were, some was up north and some were down south and some were in the middle. Um, and I just, I did that at the beginning because these groups all happened real fast and I didn't have time to make anything, so I just took the map to this second group and was like, you're up here. Uh, I, I didn't do it on purpose. Um, but over time, you know, the same NPCs started showing up, and one of them, who was this sort of beacon for a hopeful resolution for this other group, uh, the group in the north went and murdered her and killed all her cultists and, like, ruined everything. Uh, so next week, you know, and you're supposed to do this as an Apocalypse World GM, right? Even if you're running one group. Like, I was supposed to be managing my fronts, and I was supposed to show up at some point and go, hey, you know that cult? They're all dead. Um, but because I was running another group, they were, like, they were playing the my my fronts for me essentially right, um, and it it worked really well. And over time, though, they, there kept being all these hilarious Rosencrantz and Guildenstern like very near misses where I know one group is at the airfield and what the, <laughs> they're there right now and they're doing something that the group in the north definitely does not want to happen. And the group in the north they don't know that, but they're like, we haven't been to the airfield. We should go down there and see what's going on. And I'm like, oh shit. What am I gonna do? Like, if they go there, am I just gonna like play the other group as NPCs, and they're all gonna get murdered, and the whole like interconnect, and this is gonna fall apart? And they're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's go to the airfield. Yeah, that sounds cool. Well, nah, we don't have to do that right now. Let's do something else. And they kept just veering off, barely not doing that. So I sent on an email, and I was like, look, too much, too many near misses. You're driving me crazy. We're all going to meet. We're just going to go up to a bar one night. We're all just going to hang out and talk about everything that's going on and, like, talk it out and figure out what we're going to do and uh, make plans so, like, then when we go back to playing in our groups, we can, like, resolve stuff. 
But what happened was everybody met up and talked for hours and, and drank. And at the end of that, they split off into different groups. So they were like, oh, I'm going to go down and be with you guys now. Well, I'm going to go up there because I'm going to... And so all the, all, all the players shuffled around. Not all, but a bunch of them shuffled around. <laughs> it was crazy. And somebody else, uh, Brandon or someone, he, he had made a second character to play with his advancement. And he decided playing two characters sucked. Uh, he really didn't like it. Uh, so Ryan was like, well, I'll, I'll play him. So I'll just ditch my PC and play your other guy for you. <laughs> And someone else's character had died, and someone else wanted to play them, coming back as his revenant, and blah, 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 blah. So, so yeah, all of that, that a long anecdote is to say, uh, that type of play I, is exciting and really awesome. And, um, barely, of, barely worked, but with Blades, I think it is more achievable. Speaking of character switches, uh, this is a little less extreme, but entertaining. I'm, uh, I know of a group where... Uh, there's two players, both of them wanted to play Hound and Lurk, and they couldn't decide which one they wanted. So they made a pair of twins. One was a Hound, was one was a Lurk, and they randomly shuffled character sheets at the beginning of every game. <laughs> 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 they play whichever one they get. So, oh uh, my god. That's uh, amazing. That's happening right now in Pittsburgh. So <laughs> <laughs> That's so good. <laughs> Which playbook's the most popular in your experience that people just go towards? Uh, what So what's really interesting is uh, I'm going to have to answer this a little bit cautiously because uh, I played earlier versions of Blades where there were no playbooks. It was just sure. skill sets, and you made your character based on whatever you wanted, and you just focused on the skills you wanted. And there used to be whisper skills uh, kind of en masse, and now there aren't. But um, in terms of the tables that I'm seeing... Uh, a lot of people realize early on that if they don't have a whisper in their group, they're not 100% sure how they're going to handle magic. So somebody, there's undoubtedly somebody at the table who's like, be a creepy ghost binder, I'm in! And then uh, Cutter is popular. Uh, Lurk is super popular because it's the archetypical thief, right? Like, if you want to be a badass and steal stuff, like, that is, like, if you think of Garrett in the Thief series, he is a thief. And so, like, uh, a lot of people do that. I've seen, uh, I actually... The only one that I... Now, this is weird. I've actually seen Hound also be popular, but it's the only one that I can't think of, like, an archetypical example for. Like, uh, for the most part, all of the other books, I'm like, yes, this is what a cutter looks like. Okay, so this is the thief when I think of thief. Uh, but, like, uh, Hound's been... Actually, all of them are popular. It just depends on what people want. People want to see themselves as, like, totally suave and be able to do, like, face stuff. Then, you know, they play the slide, and so... Um, yeah, I've seen I've seen all of them. the only the only ones that I haven't seen a lot of are are the ones that are currently uh, I don't know what are you calling them John special edition limited edition stretch goals stretch goals yeah 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 I haven't seen I haven't seen a lot of the the stretch goal ones largely because they're not around as much but I'm sure we'll those we'll see you play too yeah in our group. Um... Slide hasn't been super popular. Um, I think everything else is pretty even. Um, I mean, we have we have had a slide, but uh, I think we've seen Cutter Lurk, uh, Leech, but one of the hat stretch goals. Um, uh, we have two cutters right now. I think if I had to guess one, I'd say it's got to be Whisper. I mean, mm -hmm. there's just something about people like the the magic angle, but also the like it's like being a brainer. I think like it's it's the, it has that same kind of appeal. Um, you're the weirdo, the 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 one who knows stuff other people don't, who can do stuff other people can't, and that's that appeals to a, a, a lot of a lot of people. I think. Um, I, I want to play the All Whisper game someday. I, I, I will make that happen uh, as a player or a GM. Can, can I can I throw one tidbit in here that's actually kind of awesome? I'm gonna give a uh, I, I I'm gonna give a call out a call out to John Sheldon who played the most interesting Whisper. Uh, just I've seen a lot of Whispers. A lot of them are creepy. A lot of them are are you know they they all have their weird spooky things that they do. Uh, he played a guy who who used to be on a Leviathan ship and he was actually the muscle. So he was playing Whisper, but he had, like, Murder and Mayhem and Command, 
and his spirit mask was his pocket handkerchief that had been dipped in Leviathan blood that he would just wipe over his face to see ghosts. And he was the biggest, baddest, toughest person, so he was, like, the caster that would actually, like, break bones and, like, intimidate people. So it was, like, the most interesting take I had seen just because it was so not what you expected it to be. And it worked fine? Uh, yeah, it was stellar. And, and actually, it drove home some points that are, like... You expect all of these people to have certain skill sets, and of course there are starting dots and stuff's already in place, but what's really, uh, it was actually kind of comforting to see, because what it tells you is that you don't have to be a stereotype. You can play whatever you want. You want to play the badass Whisperer who starts with Veteran and takes Battleborn? Okay. You can do that, <laughs> and you're going to be awesome at it, and then you're just going to be like a little bit weird, and you're going to have your mask and stuff, and so um, yeah, it's actually, it's actually kind of <clears throat> fascinating to see the sort of different takes that you can take on each of the characters that are not just superficial flavor, and I think that's pretty cool. Yeah, that's really good. Um, the uh, starting uh, this happens with the apocalypse world too, in my experience. You uh, you have a strong sort of hook when you choose your character type, but through play, you know, the game lets you kind of bleed out and explore, and there isn't niche protection exactly. Like, I know Vincent um, hits that a little bit hard in Apocalypse World because his, his home group is, is super into niche protection and he wants to, you know, protect that uh, for, for those players. Um, and our, our group is too. I am not at all. It's a, it's a running joke that uh, I every time we, when we start a new rev of, of Blaze in the Dark, I say... The playbooks aren't unique, you know, you don't have to... And someone's like, wait, are you playing that one? Okay, I'll pick something else. Every time. Every time. And so this this most recent time, two of the players weren't, weren't there for the first session. So we did character creation. And then when they came back, everyone else hid their character books uh, on the table since so they couldn't see what they had chosen. And we're like, okay, pick the one you want to play. You can't know <laughs> what other people pick. Uh, and, and someone was like, Wait, we're we're not allowed to look. I was like, I can't keep. You can look at them if you want. I can't stop you from looking at them. But if 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 once in our lives we're gonna have multiples, this is when we're gonna do it. So that's why we have two cutters because they didn't know uh, <laughs> what the other people had chosen. <laughs> Played an all vampire monster hearts game once. That was exciting. Oh wow, that sounds amazing. Yeah. <laughs> We all killed each other. It ended badly. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. Um, I think we might be out of questions unless you guys have your own. I've asked them throughout the conversation. Cool, cool. Two, two and a half hours is pretty pretty good, so uh, I think we've done well. I'm sure. Yeah, I don't see any other other pressing questions here. Um, just out of curiosity, uh, are you are you guys playing anything else right now that's um, getting you excited about role playing games? Um, the thing that I not playing it. Trying to get like I just picked up a, a used copy of um, freaking um, free market. Like oh. I was like you know I, like you know I could I was like I, I could never justify buying it at list price. But like I, I was like there was like a, a used copy at a store. I was like hmm I'll, I'll grab this and like, trying to see if I can get people to do that. It also has some similarities with this. Just like the whole idea of you create these weirdos and then you all make a team <laughs> and, you, and you gain rank. And I was like I'm kind of excited about that. <laughs> Yeah, I love free market. Uh, we we had good games of that. Um, Luke Luke is another designer that uh, has has a huge influence, and um, the, I, I'm sure you can see too the influences of like Mouse Guard and Torchbearer and that kind of stuff on this design too. Torchbearer in particular, the way the the sort of play cycle of um, you know job and recovery and that, that kind of stuff. Uh, so our group's actually, uh, we're actually transitioning off of games, so we just, like, um, came out of our, our, we had, like, a Night Witches game, and then we were doing a couple of one-shots, um, so our, our 
this was originally going to be our Saturday campaign, but we switched this to being the Tuesday campaign. And so Saturday we started playing Mouse Guard, but that's... <laughs> I spent most of Saturday wishing for a Mice in the Dark hack. Uh, so uh, we'll see how that goes. Uh, we'll give that a go for a bit. But uh, yeah, uh, no- nothing specific yet. That was just kind of like the thing that we picked. Uh, we do a lot of one shots, particularly like on Wednesday nights and stuff. So um, it's a mix up. It's a, there's a lot of like really short form games that are coming out from a bunch of designers. So that's that's kind of what we've been doing. Uh, we've also been iterating. A couple of us are working on different games. So people have been actually play testing a couple of their things. I know that Wednesday nights we do Arcadia usually. So um, yeah, that's the thing. Oh, I actually do have a little mechanical question that probably takes, like, nothing at all to answer, but it came up when I was just, like, looking at the, the aftermath of this session. Like, um, each of the, like, you know, the, you start out with the, um, the the countdown clocks for, like, the three different um, groups that are out there, like, you know, the, the crows, the, the red sashes, and the lamp blacks, and, like, the lamp blacks are, like, destroy the red sashes, and so... They, you know, they, 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 the PCs in my group, they, they took a job from the, the Lamp Blacks and, like, successfully, like, destroyed, like, just, like raided the lamp, the, the Red Sash's vault and, like, burned down, like, one of their buildings. It's like, how do I, like, do I mark stuff for the Lamp Blacks' is, the Lamp Blacks, um, countdown clock there? Do I just, like, determine that ad hoc, or is that, like, is there a mechanic for that that I'm missing? Yep. There, there. <laughs> There is a mechanic, but uh, I forget if it's in the quick start. Uh, let me look and see. Uh, I'll give you the page and stuff if I find it real quick. Or I'll, I'll, I'll just tell you either way. Um, I believe it's on the factions page, which is page five, I think. Let's look. Come on, computer, you can do it. He says you may also you may add or remove a segment on a faction's project clock when you perform a mission or pull off a score. So that does yes. seem to answer that question. Yes, that okay. is that is the part I was thinking of. Yeah. Um, so it, the reason it says may is, uh, you know, it's it's a bit of a judgment call there. Um, if you know, if if they're if they're, uh, um, yeah, if if their, you know, desire is to make sure that their boss marries the noble woman, then, like, burning down the guy's warehouse doesn't really, mm-hmm. you know, help, right? So you it, you would you would make a judgment call there. And then, as Strauss just reminded me, um, uh, faction missions also can uh, reduce their hold by two. Uh, so you have that option as well. And, and both, if you want, uh, if you want to hit them real hard. The, the way, usually the way those clocks are set up, in, in this, in this case, they both have the same size. They're both, like, eight, I think, to destroy each other. So if the PCs don't get involved, then they just tick down together in the background until they both fill at the same time, and those gangs just like wipe each other out or whatever happens. <clears throat> um, so yeah, it's by by the PCs doing something that'll that'll tip the scales, you know, one way or the other. And then there'll be cases where you know one group will have destroy the enemy, and they'll have a four section clock, and the other group will have destroy those guys, and they'll have a twelve section clock because they just you know it's totally unfair. Uh, how that's going to go down. Cool. Uh, okay. Are we? I think I think we have exhausted our fun for the evening. <laughs> that was fun. Yeah. Thanks for <laughs> thanks for showing up and jumping in. That was that was great. Thanks. Thanks for the invite. Good thing. Anytime. Mhm. I'll probably keep posting a- actual plays of this game as it goes. Oh man, I appreciate that. I know how hard it is to write those up. It's a, it's a chore, so I really appreciate you doing that. It's might are happening on the back end, but the same. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's so helpful. I mean, even at this point when the game is is like gone gold and the mechanics are locked and stuff, like there's all these little bits, you know, that you think, oh yeah, that's a better way to present that, or I should explain that better, or whatever. And, um, it's it's really 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 helpful. So. Coin on the factions is going to be really useful because I was funny story. I actually <laughs> had just written those notes for myself since they're <laughs> at war with one. So yeah, it makes sense, right? I mean, uh, yeah, there. Yeah. 
All right. Well, thanks to everyone who asked questions. Uh, that was really productive. And uh, we're recording this. Um, I don't know if anyone is still watching live right now, but it'll also be up on YouTube uh, later tonight. I'll post some links to that uh, and uh, in the forums and stuff. So if you want to watch two and a half hours of, of us talking about Plays in the Dark, you totally can. <laughs> who doesn't? Um, yeah. I mean, what's better than that, really? Uh, <laughs> So thanks so much to Adam and Strash, and uh, we will see you guys uh, next time. Bye.